Suikoden 2 is widely considered to be one of the greatest JRPGs of all time, certainly right up there with the best on the console. Yet this PS1 masterpiece from Konami consistently ranks near the top. As you may know, I'm a big fan of the original game and even made a rather bold statement that I like it more than Suikoden 2. Now those new to watching this, don't be angry because I did caveat to that heavily if you watch that big retrospective I did on the original game. I think I made a lot of fair points about that, but if I had to sum it up into one phrase, my argument could be condensed into, uh, I'm a little bit weird. But if you want to know the whole story of that, go watch my big massive review of it that I did. It was the first video I made for this channel, and so yeah, you can see my full arguments. I think I made a fair point, you know, I love the game despite its quirks. It's only natural then that I should revisit Suikoden 2. Unlike the original game, which I'd played and completed multiple times, Suikoden 2 was a one-time fling. I did genuinely enjoy it, at least according to my memory, but for whatever reason, I only went back to Suikoden 1, and I couldn't really tell people why. Over the years, memories of it faded and excuses became difficult, having to resort to the I'm a bit weird line. Maybe I was even wrong to like Suikoden 1 more. I was always planning on tackling Suikoden 2 at some point, but perhaps not for a year after the original. However, almost like magic from my Suikoden 1 retrospective came the announcement of a remaster of Suikoden 1 and 2 planned for early next year. It fired up something inside me to get to it much earlier. And by something, I mean the algorithm. Please love me, YouTube. This video is dedicated to my wonderful patrons over on Patreon. I thank you eternally for your support. If you want to join them and hopefully drive me towards full time, then check the links in the description. What do you get? Well, a lot. You get to watch these videos early, ad-free. You get a whole exclusive bonus video with every big video. You get project updates on a secret Discord. And if you're on the second tier, you can even vote for things like thumbnail choices and which video I'm going to make next. After two long ass JRPGs, I need a shorter game and it looks like the vote has gone in favour of Parasite Eve, which uh, looking at it might not actually be that short after all. Never mind! But anyways, back to the bonus video. For Suikoden 2, I'm continuing going through the Suikoden spin-offs and this time, I'm taking a look at Genso Suikoden Card Stories, a Game Boy Advance retelling of Suikoden 2, but as a card battler. Did you know that exists? Well, you can watch it right now on patreon.com slash a bit more Jordan. But you're here for the most important thing, the Sui Code and 2 retrospective. I played it, I've completed it, and the big question is, do I still like Sui Code and 1 more? Well, hopefully I can answer that in about 3 hours. As before, I'm taking you through the entire story beat by beat. If you're here only for the actual retrospective analysis, then skip to this time. That's where the meat will be, but I would advise you to watch it all the way through because I think you'll enjoy it if you've got the time. And I'll try and be funny and make it entertaining along the way. Plus there will be analysis in here too, so uh, yeah, enjoy. The original Suikoden was released in Japan in December 1995 on the Sony PlayStation. Suikoden 1 released almost exactly three years later in 1998. It released in North America in 99, and Europe obviously had to wait for eternity, arriving in a different century, literally. The story follows on from the first game, at least in the timeline, taking place three years after the events of the first game, which if you remember, was when the corrupt Scarlet Moon Empire was toppled by our little rebellion. While Suikoden 2 is set in a different country, north of the border, the events of the first game have a ripple effect up here. At least we will see down the line. And there's even a nice little gimmick of being able to load your save data from Suikoden 1 into Suikoden 2. If you load up the Suikoden 1 save file just before the final battle, you will carry some things over and even get exclusive content. Most of it is small, but there is one really huge thing that personally makes it worth doing. So yes, 100% complete Suikoden 1 first, then play Suikoden 2. They're almost like a duology, but I'll get more into that save data stuff later on. But for now, the plot is thus. Two countries have been at war. The Highland Kingdom in the north have been fighting against the city-states of Jostan, a coalition of sorts made to combat the increasing power of the Highland. After years of war, 
peace appears to be on the horizon. A treaty between the two powers is on the cards. On the eve of the conclusion of the war, we meet our heroes, Ryo and Joey. Two young lads, part of the cadet-like unicorn brigade in the Highland Army, as we witness one of the most shocking JRPG openings that I can think of. Camped out in the mountains, tomorrow they will go home to their loved ones. Ryo is so excited he's already changed out of his uniform. Here you'll get familiar with the controls. Thankfully, you can run straight from the off in this game. You don't need some dumb crystal to facilitate that. Going for some nice fresh air before bed, something isn't right. As you're walking the mountain pass, you see a shadow move. Rather than worrying too much, you just want to go home, so head back to sleep. But in the middle of the night, there is an unwanted surprise. No, someone's not drawn a cock on your forehead. The camp is on fire, and your captain, Raud, tells you to follow the mountain path to escape an ambush. On the way, you see wounded troops, some dead, some on their way to being dead. What happened to the peace treaty? Before you get to the bottom, however, Joey says the smart thing. There is only one real way down this mountain, and someone's going to be waiting. A secondary ambush to slaughter those who make it down. It's something you should run and tell your captain about. As you make your way back up the mountain, you can see the difference. The once wounded and scared soldiers you came past are now dead. Re-entering the camp, you see your captain, some soldiers, and an important looking figure. Raud says the ambush worked perfectly. Like, what's going on here? Is he a traitor working for Jostan? No, because he's talking to Luca Blight. Prince of Highland, your prince who's just killed his own men. This is a false flag operation. Luca does not want the peace treaty to happen and sacrificed a youth brigade in order to make it look like the other side, the Jostan state, broke the agreement, hence starting the war back up again. This is too much for the two young kids to even comprehend what's going on, they've just got to escape. They can't go down the mountain path, so they go up. But you are rumbled by Raud, and it's time to fight the soldiers of your own country to get out and survive. This is easy work for Ryo and Joey's unite attack. They're pretty badass. Buying yourself some time, the only way is to jump in the river below. But before that almost certain drop to your death, Ryo and Joey make a vow to return to this very spot if they get separated, marking a stone with their weapons. And in an act of desperation, they jump. Every JRPG needs a short, impactful, punchy opening to hook the player in, inviting them to stay 30 hours more with the story. I mean, Final Fantasy VII has the raid on the reactor, Final Fantasy VI has the Esper Retrieval, Skies of Arcadia, a raid on a Valuan airship, Suicoden 1 has you, uh, collecting taxes. Okay, not all of them, but it's a great way to pull the player in and make the game stick in the memory. This is a really great opening. It's shocking. Why on earth would anyone sacrifice their own soldiers? Perhaps in a desperate way to save more lives later on, but from a personal ambitious standpoint, you know this Luca fella ain't someone to mess with. And even though Ryo and Joey are technically fighting for him, you've instantly switched sides. You are now a traitor with a good reason to be. This opening is literally only 10 minutes long, there's only one small piss easy fight, yet the way it's structured, unraveling piece by piece, it's brilliant. I love the touch of the soldiers changing on the way back up, it's unnerving, like something's gone horribly wrong in the middle of something going horribly wrong. And that promise at the end, you know that's going to be called back to. Suicoden 2, you're going to be in for a ride. The title sequence starts and you can see the two boys growing up together. Best friends, training together, laughing together, graduating together, off to war together. Apparently they're too badass to wear helmets. It's short but gets you up to speed. You don't really have many more questions about their past right now. And then a punch. To a Suicoden 1 player, you'll be delighted to see the portrait of Victor, a very important and reliable character from the original game. 
Why he's here, we don't know, but as the player possibly knows him, you do feel rather safe. If anyone can protect you, it's Victor. You try to recall the events that just happened, but oddly, and something quite confusing to me, Rio states it was in fact the state army, the Jostan army, that attacked them. Even though he just saw Luca Blight right there. His captain right there, his soldiers right there. Unless he's just too dim to understand, which is a possibility. And yeah, this will confuse people who are new to the game. Because after 10 minutes, the jargon between the, the Highland, the Jostan state, it probably hasn't settled into the brain yet as to what each of them mean. It turns out Victor, although an independent mercenary, he's working for the Jostan state, the enemy of Highland and technically your enemy too. And Victor is not an enemy you want. And out of nowhere will pop another familiar face to players of Suicoden 1, Flick. While Flick and Victor often grinded each other's gears, they were always reliable and came across as a bit of a buddy cop duo. In fact, if you recall the ending of Suicoden 1, both of them hold back enemy forces as the castle around you collapses. They disappeared without a trace. Well, you'll be happy to know they're doing fine hanging around in the north. You are technically a security risk since you're considered to be an enemy, so in their jail you go, in their mercenary fort. Here you'll meet Paul, who is a nice chap and becomes your supervisor as you do menial tasks to earn your food. Pushing crates, which is a thing you do about twice in the whole game, and you'll have to remember it in about five hours from now. Don't be an absolute tool and get stuck in a dungeon because you forgot you could do that. <clears throat> After that wild opening, the game definitely slows down a bit too much. You're really just helping out doing chores. I do chores in real life. Why would anyone want to clean stuff in video games? You're eventually trusted enough to head to a nearby village to pick up some supplies for the kitchen. You're accompanied by guards, of course, a dog and a little boy slash girl. Yeah, Suicoden 2 has this like androgyny thing going on. Not as much, but the kids. Always the kids. And again, as I said in Suicoden 1, it's not a complaint or anything. It's just an observation and I'm genuinely not mistaking them on purpose. I guess it's just the art style. Now, this is not an interesting section. It's a big tease. You're seeing characters with portraits. You probably know what that means, but there is a bit of a build-up to something, because while you've been doing these tasks, you've been picking up some potential escape material like rope. And one night, when you're alone in your cell, you hear a voice. Well, there's no voice acting, so you see a voice? Joey is here, and he is going to bust you out of jail. But as you're making your escape, it's like Jabba's palace scene from Return of the Jedi. They're waiting for you at the top of the stairs. And now, you're both banged up. This time, you're getting properly interrogated. And finally, Ryo decides to tell the truth about what happened. Why he would lie in the first place, I don't know. While you don't get much personality from Ryo, Joey is definitely very lovable here. Just something as simple as asking Ryo if he wants to eat his carrots. A small but telling gesture. And it's time to escape straight away. The last thing they'd expect. Throwing a Molotov cocktail in a wooden building seems like a recipe for a massacre, but we've got a home to get to. It'll be dangerous there considering your brigade was butchered, but uh, Ryo's sister will be waiting for him. So we've got to go there. As you re-enter the local village, you'll be coerced into participating in a gypsy show with tarot cards, fire breathing, and their main event, knife throwing. One of the ladies takes a shine to you and decides to throw knives at fruit on your head. Usually I need to date ladies for at least two months before they start throwing knives at me. I love how they all start going apeshit when they pull out the orange. Anyways, these three performers are thankful, but are moving on to their next destination. Ailey, Rena, and Bolgan the Man Baby, you decide to travel together because the North Swallow Pass leading back home has tough monsters and murmurings of a mist demon or thing, I don't know. Now you have five party members, it's time to remind you about formations. Vastly important for the game, each playable character can have a short range, medium range or long range ability. Medium fighters can fight anywhere on the two rows of three, but short range fighters, you definitely need to be on the front row, otherwise they won't be able to attack. Except the mages, because most mages are short range fighters, but you don't want them on the front row because there will be a massacre. Stick them on the back. 
Long range fighters speak for themselves. They can attack any enemy from the back row. So now you've got baby Andre the Giant, stick his chubby ass on the front row, leave Ailey on the back. It's time to head north. Unfortunately, North Swallow Pass is guarded by guards who won't let you through unless you have permission. Bit of a bummer, but this girl Rina has a solution. Sultry music starts playing and asks to be with the captain privately. Much minutes later, he awkwardly says, you can pass. They don't call it the Swallow Pass for nothing. What a girl. So yeah, you're free to climb your first dungeon, which frankly, the dungeons here aren't particularly exciting. Suicoden 1 wasn't great either and this is par for the course. If you're not climbing through mountains, you're walking through forests. But it's a minor point because when you get to the top, you'll be fighting your first boss. And it will put up a fight, especially if you've become complacent against the easy random encounters. But if you die, not to worry because Suicoden 2 is very generous with save points. If you see a save point, it means there's going to be a boss coming in about one minute. Suicoden 2 is not a difficult RPG by any means, but it may catch you off guard once or twice just to make you learn your lesson. Don't get complacent. Eventually, you'll be on the other side of the mountain and back in your hometown. And your traveling companions part ways, but don't worry, blowjob lady won't be far away, she'll be back. Joey decides to head home first, and you head to your home to find your sister. But you're in Cairo, you might as well take a look around, talk to some old faces. But something is wrong. Talking to the townspeople, they either tell you to run away while you can, or they are scared to be with you. Because it turns out, the entire slaughter of the Unicorn Brigade has been blamed on you. The propaganda machine warmed up to say you were the traitorous spies who allowed it to happen. Brutal. The innkeeper tells you to grab your sister and run, or spend 100 pots to stay the night. Respect the hustle. Before I went home, I went to check out Joey's house, not because I care about him, I just got lost and ended up there. But I did see a scene where he is ostracized by his family, at least his stepfather and stepbrother, for being a traitor and bringing disrepute upon the wealthy family name. He is refused access to see his real mother. Eventually, you will find your house, where round the back you'll see your sister Nanami praying at your adoptive father's grave. Nanami is quite the personality. She's a hyperactive, overly emotional comedy foil and she is wonderful. She's caring, she'll protect your little unit at all costs, but she hates fighting. She greets you only in the way she could and it's hilarious and her chatty ways is the perfect remedy for real silence. With her by your side, it's time to get out of dodge. The Highland soldiers have spotted you. It's time for a rumble. She wields a three-section staff. Whoever trained them is mightily fond of wood, but despite kicking ass, there are too many of them and you are arrested. You are thrown in jail with Joey, ready for public execution and to make the lie become the truth. No one will ever know. As the day comes, you're led out in chains, but on the way to the execution ground, a horse and carriage is in your path. Out looks a regal looking lady who wishes to hear your words. It's a chance meeting that will come back around at a later time. I'm sure we'll meet her again. What, you really think we're gonna get executed? Well, they take a couple of whippings at least, and this is a really great scene. Captain Roud starts admiring the sunset, and then when he turns back around, All his men are dead, that's brilliant. Flick and Victor are here to save the day. Why they would bother chasing after you two, probably just down to convenience of the plot, uh, and also they wanted an awesome scene. Sadly, Rao doesn't get his comeuppance, but these veteran swordsmen are joining you to go and burst Nanami out. She's been dealt with elsewhere. I guess they don't have gender neutral execution sites here. Let's bust her out. Well, actually, as I mentioned, Nanami is badass, and she's well on her way to trying to bust you out. Yeah, you don't need to help her. You're running back to the mercenary's fort. Unfortunately, that means trekking back all the way there. 
Suicoden 2 isn't very generous when it comes to saving you time or teleporting you to the right place. There's plenty of backtracking here, and it's not so bad for the most part because you're never really too far away, but having a whole damn mountain to climb, basically walking through a whole dungeon, is quite annoying in this particular case. Never mind, you're safe. Now you're free. You've essentially become a mercenary yourself, part of this group of bandits. Swords for hire, at least for the time being. In fact, Victor's first task for you is to go and recruit more allies. Did someone say recruitment? It's time! Even earlier than the first game. Although to be fair, you already had your castle at this point in Suicoden 1. We're going to be waiting a while for that here. I guess this is a kind of tutorial for the recruitment mechanics. There aren't many locations you can visit at this minute, but there are a handful of characters you can recruit for your army. Oh, that should be Victor's army, but don't worry, we will usurp power very soon. There are a couple of towns and a small forest you can go in. I picked up Rikimaru, Millie, Zamza, Kinison, and Shiro the dog. You can get a dog in your party. And let me tell you, Shiro is amazing. At least in the early parts of this game, at this stage, his attack power is through the roof. Okay, you can't equip any items, because if you try putting a helmet on a dog, don't. And any kind of magic will make him roll over and play dead. But for this early part of the game, he's in beast mode, literally. Now, as you know, each Suicoden game has 108 characters to collect. Many of them are fighters, a lot of them have abilities at your castle, like listening to the soundtrack, changing the sound effects, play mini games, And for this playthrough, I don't want to spoil it, but I did get them all. However, I'm going to spare you watching me recruit every single one of them. It's pretty much the main treat of Suicoden, and I may be spoiling the story, but I don't want to spoil that rush of finding every single one of the heroes. You'll have to take my word, I found them all. So, you've got yourself a nice little crew and you'll eventually trigger a cutscene in a slightly more distant village of Toto. This is the place Joey told you he ended up after jumping off the cliff. He was nursed by a family with a young girl called Pilika, who's excited to see Uncle Joey back again. She's a sweet little girl who wants to buy a gift for her father, an amulet for his birthday. Muse isn't far away, just a little west of here over the river, and in your recruitment adventure, why not go out of your ways and help her a little? It's cute as buttons that she gives you her very precious 70 pots to go out and buy it. There's just something so cute about kids and how little money can be so huge to them. Do you remember when you were a kid and you had a fiver and it was just like the best thing in the world? You could buy anything with a fiver. Mom, please take this five pounds and go buy Zelda for me. And then she'd come back with Zelda. Obviously, I didn't realize she paid the rest of it. Muse is one of the biggest cities in the game, like a proper town. It feels like the equivalent of Gregminster in Suicoden 1. It's a step up from the shanty towns we've mostly seen up to this point, and it's going to be playing a big role in the plot, but not now. For now, you just need to go to the shop and buy the amulet for Pilika, and of course, it's more than 70 potch, and either you can put up the extra cash, or Joey will sell his ring to pay for it, damn boy. This may seem like a pointless fetch quest with no meaning, but it does have an importance because it wants you to meet Pilika, go out, and come back. Why? Emotional damage. Because you return to find Toto devastated, burned to a crisp. Pilika is thankfully alright, but everyone else, everyone else is dead. Eventually, a familiar face from Suicoden 1 appears to tell you about Luca Blight, looting villagers to keep his army entertained. She wants to find Victor as soon as possible. Luca is on a rampage and will soon try his luck on Muse, but Victor's fortress is in his way. This calls for immediate action and you are needed to help out. Apple is a strategist, assistant to Matthew in the first game, and she'll be laying traps. Flake will send word to Muse, and Victor will try to gather more men. And we, we need to find a beady-eyed man in the woods. Oh yeah. Ty is a master of the spear, and the only one who can fix the mercenary's fire spear. He seems already resigned into helping the cause, but on the way back down the forest path, you enter back into Ryube, and the village you bought supplies from, and join the circus act, it's devastated. 
brought to its knees. Probably down to the awful CGI cutscene, it's almost enough for anyone to implode. It's a massacre, and Luca Blight is laughing his arse off, murdering for the sake of murdering. And it's one of the harshest scenes in the game, setting the tone for why you are fighting so hard against Luca. He makes a woman beg for her life and act like a pig, before going back on his word and slaughtering her anyways. He is a monster. There is no doubt about who you must fight. With your task done, it's time to prepare for war. But Victor and Flick don't believe you're strong enough to be part of an army. So, a quick test. Flick versus Ryo, a one-on-one -on -one duel. Yeah, you remember duels from Suicoden 1? Well, they're back. And instead of just having three of them in the story, we have a generous five in this one. I like them. I get that they could get annoying if they were overused, but they last no more than a few minutes or so. So once again, the game could have done with more of them, especially important ones. Two of them aren't even proper fights to the death, like this one. You just have to hurt him enough and he'll allow you to form a company in the coming battle. And you get to name your company. And there's only going to be one name for my company, the Smeg Army. This is your first war battle. And if you just came off the back of Suicoden 1, it's looking a little different. Gone are the comical chibi visuals, gone are the rock, paper, scissors mechanics, this is now Fire Emblem. Without the sheen, polish or meaning. Yeah, I'll get into that more in the main analysis, but essentially, it's your old school Fire Emblem, but with the budget of a ham sandwich. You have different troop types, often commanded and assisted by your Stars of Destiny. Each have a strength and defensive stat that come into play when units attack each other if they can be bothered to do anything. Accuracy is not a thing in these war battles. Just because they're not great, you do have to be careful, like they can seriously affect the ending. Remember your recruited characters? Well, they can die. Like, properly die. For good. Fire Emblem die, you know? Which is cool, I always love that risk, it's tense and stuff, but it does completely ruin the chance of getting the best ending, so make sure you always save before these. Oh. And they're silent, by the way. Half of the war battles in this version of the game have a bug, which means there's no music at all. Just really awkward silence. You can almost hear the crickets chirping. So yeah, as you may have gathered, I'm not a huge fan of these war battles, but thankfully there are only, uh, oh, 15 of them. Never mind, I'll survive. This is just a tutorial of sorts, so blast everything with your flamethrower spear. Yeah, okay, that's pretty cool. And be done with it. The enemy retreats, but only for a minute or so, because they immediately attack again. Luca does not hold back. This time, the force is even bigger. It's worth noting that you can only control Ryo in these early battles, because you haven't been assigned as King of the Universe as of yet. So these already hands of battles are extra super hands offery. Like this one, where you literally do nothing, as the Highland army pincer you and make you forfeit. It's time to split and flee. Destination, Muse. But first, you need to grab Pilika, who's holed up in the command room. It's just you and Joey, but not to worry, your United attack makes Swiss cheese of the enemy squads. As you enter the room, you see Paul struck down by Luca and Pilika wailing, about to meet the same fate, except for the will of Ryo and Joey to protect her. But it won't be for long because he's almost inhuman. He's a nutcase. Thankfully, Victor makes a nice distraction by blowing the whole thing up. Yeah, if I can't have it, it's all going to go boom. At this point, you have to get to safety. The sheer terror of what Pilika just went through has made her mute. She cannot speak anymore. Poor girl. 
first her parents, then her village, and then staring death in the face herself, it's more than any child could probably take. One interesting side note about this part is that aside from Joey and Ryo, your party is randomly chosen from the recruits you just got. I think I was pretty lucky with the best potential squad. I didn't get Millie or Kinnison, and it's a miracle. I forgot to do the formation thing, mostly short range attackers here, so yeah, remember to do that. As you re-enter Toto, Pilika's wrecked hometown on the way to Muse, she guides you to a shrine down the back that her father used to protect. Upon touching the shrine, you and Joey are transported away and a familiar face appears, the mysterious Lechnart, the same person who saw the destiny of Tyr in Suicoden 1. She's being nicely cryptic as always, I bet she would be a nightmare to be in a relationship with. Please, for the love of God, tell me why you're angry, dear. The interwoven destiny aligns with the stars. The fires of fate are burning, and the debris of sustenance stains the apparatus of consumption. Ah, uh, you want me to wash the dishes. Okay, can't you just say that? As you walk forward into the Valley of Fate, you get an interesting cutscene showing childhood memories. Ryo and Joey meeting for the first time, as Joey spies on Ryo training at the dojo. Then, get them beaten up together by bullies, a true mark of a friendship, and Nanami chasing them off. Good on Nanami. Even Ryo speaks here of his own free will as they both try to perv on the cute girl over the wall. If you and your best mate haven't spied on girls, then I'm sorry, but you're not best friends. You never have been. Even though this is about Joey and Ryo, Nanami is a big part as well, looking out for both of you. On your first day of becoming a cadet, she's watching in the bushes. One of the 27 true runes has chosen both you and Joey. The rune of beginning split into two. Do you desire power? Maybe not for your own personal gain, but you need power to protect those around you, to stop the menace that is Luca Blight. Joey gets a flaming black sword, which is totally not evil and menacing. You get a glorious holy shield. Yeah, we get the boring one. It may have been unavoidable destiny, but keep in mind for later what could have happened if you picked up Joey's and vice versa. But anyways, you have the bright shield rune. Joey has the black sword rune. When you arrive at Muse, you are denied entry. They are too worried about Highland spies. You need a permit, which is a nice JRPG excuse for a tangent to pad out the story. Perfectly acceptable to give the player something different to do. This is where Nanami comes in to add some flavor. She tries to charm the gate guards, but that goes downhill fast. Without much direction, you head back to a hotel you saw on the road here. It's time to have a rest while you think of your next plan of action. The owners of the inn are in a bit of a pickle. The dude Alex is desperate to treasure hunt the local Sindar ruins, but needs some grunts to make it less dangerous. After sleeping on it, you wake up the next day. And uh, yeah, it, it appears the child slept on the floor, as they so obviously belong. Even the dog got bed priority. <laughs> Anyways, with Alex not being able to find help in Muse, he offers to give you his permit if you help him become Indiana Jones for a bit. Why you don't just beat his ass and take it from him there and then, I don't know, but it's time to enter a dungeon round the back of the inn. This is probably one of the more unique dungeons in this game because, well, it's not a mountain, cave or forest. It's world building for the Sindar race who are very mysterious. It's also perhaps the most puzzle-like of them. Not that it's packed full of mind-bending things or anything, it's just you have to find a key. <laughs> yeah, Suikoden has never been about dungeon puzzles. Most puzzles are how to recruit characters. This is perhaps the first step up in difficulty for the game, largely because, as I said, your party for this section is completely random. Thankfully, I looked out and probably got the best possible combination, so it wasn't too tough for me. Alex is looking for treasure to turn his family fortunes upside down. His inn is failing, and he wants to provide for his family. At the end of the ruins, there better be something tasty like a two-headed snake. Don't you just love these monsters that ancient civilizations like to put in their ruins? How nice of them. How do they survive thousands of years? It's a total mystery. Anyways, with that boss out of the way, what is the treasure? 
a medicinal herb. Yeah. The greatest treasure was the health we almost lost along the way. I'm at a net loss here. I used more herbs on the way up. But actually, that is sort of the point about this side plot because as you get home, Alex's wife has fallen gravely ill and nothing seems to work to make her better. But maybe, maybe that strange herb you found in the ruins? Ta-da! Alex now knows what's most important to him, his family and their health. If you've got that, you don't really need ancient treasure. Money doesn't mean anything. Unless you're a destitute homeless person begging for just that sliver of extra gold so you might actually survive the winter. But who cares about them? With your permit in hand, finally you can get into Muse, but with Nanami's overacting and pretending to be Joey's mum, you're thrown into jail because you're so suspicious. I do love this shift in perspective from time to time. For some reason, this side-on view still works well with the character sprites, and it feels like more effort was put into the game than even what they needed to do. Joey and Ryo reminisce about the old times, wondering if they'll ever be allowed back home. The morning comes, and Victor and Flick come to allow you out of jail. Before you get down to any serious business, it's time to visit the bar owner, Leona, and see her new property and potentially recruit some new allies in town. This is a crucial part of the game if you want to recruit all of the characters, because there's this one dude called Clive, who also happens to be the most cryptic recruit in Suikoden 1. Well, here in Suikoden 2, you only have this one moment to ensure you recruit him, and it's not even now you have to set up his recruitment for later. And if you don't trigger this cutscene and agree to help Elsa in the northeast of Muse, you will be buggered. It's time to meet the mayor of Muse, Annabelle. She's the big hope of fighting the Highland army. She's the one to gather the different leaders of the Jostan state together. She's a strong Amazonian lady that everyone relies upon. Victor leaves you four kids in her care from now, and she knows almost everything about you already. It's her job to know everything about everyone. Not sure if I fancy being in the care of the KGB. I like to take my dumps in private, like nobody needs video recordings of that. She knows about Genkaku, your adoptive father, and holds a secret about his past, or at least something you've not been made aware of. But that's a discussion for another time because this exposition scene has gone on too long. Now you can take your time to look around, recruit some characters if they weren't available just now like Tuta and Anita, who is just a cryptic pain in the ass right now. You can hire her now, but it seems like RNG. However, you can recruit her more easily later on, so it's up to you. But anyways, Jess, this angry looking dude who's now your boss, is in a bit of a pickle. He was planning to send some spies into the Highland camp to check their supply situation. But the problem is, the only Highland uniforms they have are for the Youth Brigade. Apparently Victor in a cadet uniform is for fetish websites only. I await your fan art. Seeing an opportunity to exploit non-paid underage soldiers, he asks you to do it. It's a crucial mission that will require a stealthy approach. It's an important mission since it will tell the Jostan army what kind of approach Highland will take. A quick raid or a slow siege? That will help. Being brave and courageous, it's time to step up and accept the mission. Choose your party and head north. Obviously taking Shiro because if anyone gets suspicious, I'm just walking my dog, dude. Walking through the forest in the north, you'll fight your way to the enemy camp. You walk towards the supply tent and the guard who's well, guarding it. Uh, you won't know this, but this dude is also someone undercover. And he doesn't have anything to do with this game. He's in a few other Suikoden games. He's in the two visual novels and Suikoden 3. But I love the totally random foreshadowing, which was probably shoehorned in after the fight, but I love it. You even get to see this scene from the guard's perspective in the other game, which I, I won't spoil here. I'll bring that up when needed, or you can just Google it for yourself if you don't have patience. It's just an interesting point. Anyways, tangents, checking out the supplies, the job seems a bit too easy. And yes, Captain Roud spots you and you have to leg it. But there's no way out. So despite me running around for 10 minutes, uh, you have to run into one of the tents, which I didn't try because when I did walk into the other tents, it didn't let me. But this one, 
Oh yeah, this one's fine. Yeah, I checked a guide after that because I, I thought the game had glitched or something. Super Code in 2 has its glitchy moments. But yeah, this big tent is fine. And in this tent, you will meet Jillia again. The rich lady you saw before your execution. It turns out she is the sister of Luca. She's a princess. And for some reason, she's willing to protect you. Probably because Joey has a knife in his hands. I guess it's time for some tea because why not? She knows her brother is a monster, but always thought that she could control him, or at least make him take a chill pill when things got too nuts. But now her influence is waning. As you finally dare to leave, you get ambushed, and Joey tells you to run on while he keeps them at bay. He promises to catch up later. Nanami is reluctant to leave without Joey, but you have no option. You make it back, but Joey doesn't. This is one of the most powerful moments in the game, especially from the point of Nanami, who waits outside the city all night for him. You can join her as you stay there as the sun goes down. And the game does its best to let you ruin the moment by giving you the choices of dick replies all the time, but just keep her company no matter what she says. She is your big sister, but you need to be there for her, and you, you also want Joey to return. Even Pilika wants to join you. And just as Pilika falls asleep, Joey comes back. This is actually quite a surprise. Did anyone think it would come back so soon? I wasn't thinking that, but it's a welcome return. There is a real good feeling in the air, and you will definitely feel so much closer to the characters involved. Now, I know most of you want to keep politics out of games, but now it's time for politics of the intriguing variety. Oh yes, it's time for the meeting on Hilltop. All the state city leaders gathering together, from the Matilda Knights to South Window to Tinto and the Two Rivers. It's time to see how they will decide to deal with Highland. You're introduced to the various leaders of the Confederation, each of whom you'll eventually interact with over the course of the story, whether on good terms or bad. Because let's just say, this coalition is already fractured, and like a wolf pack without a leader, they can't agree to commit to helping with the impending invasion of Muse, despite the fact that an invasion is already beginning while they're sitting on their fat asses, some just aren't convinced or are just too tired of fighting and can't spare any more men. But there's no time to talk. You've got to repel the invasion or at least delay them before reinforcements can arrive. After doing your job, Annabelle promises to tell you more about your father's mysterious past another war battle. This one is actually rather important because it's easy to completely mess up getting the best ending of the game. In this battle, the Highland army have a mercenary unit led by a dude called Gilbert. If you play your cards right, he will join you mid-battle. It's pretty hard to mess up, but it can happen, and if you don't recruit him here, you'll never be able to get him again. I did it the first time of asking, but then uh, one of the characters, Miklatov, was actually killed in battle, so I had to do it again. Lovely. After delaying the enemy, you settle down for the night. Nanami really wants to tell you something, but the nerves get better of her. Meanwhile, in the next room... No! What the hell is going on here? Joey receiving orders from a ninja. And this time, you even see him. This is shady stuff and you're kind of panicking. What is going on? As the evening arrives, you want to go find out all about your adoptive father from Annabelle. But before that, you get to see a scene with Victor and the mayor as they drink together. No doubt there's feelings between the two, which is not something you'd expect from two very strong-willed leaders. It's a tender moment between two supporting characters, and it's something the game needs. It can't always focus on Ryo, Joey, and Nanami. But now, it's time for your meeting with her. You and Nanami are allowed access, with the guard mentioning that your friend already went ahead. What? Who? Joey? Put that knife away, young man. There's so many questions running through your head right now. What is Joey thinking? Why is he doing this? He's not really going to do it, is he? It has to be a trick, right? 
you walk into the room and it's too late. Joey is standing over the mortally wounded Annabelle before escaping himself. Jess walks in and the little turd thinks you've done it. But there's no time to process because the Highland army has entered the city in the cover of night. Annabelle begs you to stay alive and run. And run you must. Oh my god, this is the first holy crap moment in the game. You genuinely don't know what to think. You have so many questions. And you might even deride it for being ludicrous. There's no possible way this could happen. It is a powerful moment in the game and it's going to be the last time you see Muse for quite a while. The entire region is now in the hands of Highland and you can only flee south of the lake to South Window. You're going to need a ship. In a local village, you meet up with the traveling trio once more and they join you in grabbing a ship. There are rumors of a guy called Taiho in town with a boat who's willing to risk the Highlanders. You may remember him and his surfer dude bro and he'll take you if you beat him in a game of dice. I'm just getting non flashbacks from the first game. I spent like 40 minutes on that part. Thankfully, I won him straight away this time around. Lady Luck was on my side. Victor is already in South Window, which is a major city in the Joston City States. It's a nice place, one of the better looking towns in the game, with a lovely Chinese style. You'll come across plenty of characters here too, who all have portraits, meaning they will be recruitable in the near future. It's like looking at a packet of biscuits you just can't open yet. It's time to meet the mayor and tell them what happened. Hopefully you can get a base of operations for our men. But Grand Mayor, the, well, the mayor, asked you to do him a favor first. Victor is originally from a town called North Window, and there have been rumors of young ladies disappearing near it. If you're familiar with Suicoden 1, you may remember of hearing of Victor's hometown being destroyed by... Oh no. The Lord of the Neck. Seriously, he's dead. We killed him. I very much remember killing him because he's the most difficult boss in the entire game. He's dead, right? Alright, even though there's the Highland threat, we've got to check this out. The mayor's assistant, Freed, comes along to help out. North Window is an overrun mess. Wild trees, random graves, it's abandoned. Aside from the main vampire himself. A quick skirmish tells you that once again you are no match. You can't even hurt the bugger. And once again, you need the help of the Dragon Star Sword. Victor dumped it in a nearby cave after he thought he'd be done with it last time. So yeah, let's go get that. Okay, there's no denying that this is rehashing a plotline from the original game. Something which you could see as a negative. You can't fight Necklord, you go to a cave, you pick up a sword, then you go fight him properly. Beat for beat done already. But the twist here is that it's actually mixing two different plot beats from the first game into one. And by doing so, somehow makes it original. Can you guess what the other plotline is? Not you have already played the game. It's cheating. Anyways, this is a long, windy cave that's near the end you meet up with a dude called Khan. What is it with Suicode and characters hanging around in caves? I just like to think they're selling aftershave and condoms. Because I'm pretty sure in the Suicoding universe there are no nightclubs, so those guys have got to hang around somewhere. They've got to do business somewhere. Why not caves? Makes sense. This place has the mildest of puzzles too. Apparently the Windy Cave is pretty windy, and you have to block the wind with stone. If you remember, you can push blocks. Yeah, remember like eight hours ago when you learned to do that? Well, I didn't. I forgot. And I lost at least 30 minutes walking out of the dungeon then all the way back in when I did remember that. And you'll be greeted by an old friend. If you thought the sword was grumpy in the first game, think about his mood now after being unceremoniously dumped in a gusty cave for three years. He is not a happy bunny. But the fight is quite easy. He recognizes your power and agrees to go after Necklord. With Khan, a vampire hunter saying he can seal Necklord's power, you head into Necklord's castle. It's a pretty confusing place with loads of doors to go into, but somehow I ended up going the correct way every single time. 
And up to Necklord you go. Your pulse is racing right now. You know this is not going to be an easy fight. And there he is, by himself, playing his organ. I always knew he was a lonely boy. Sure, he has endless brides, but do they really connect? Necklord tries to distract Victor by summoning Daisy, someone very close to him, who he swear he saw die. It's a trick, and Victor won't be fooled. Just before you're about to make Mr. Lovebite bite the dust, he pisses off! Talk about an anticlimax! Yeah, you don't face him here, he runs off and leaves this literal abomination. And wow, he is tough. I had to fight him twice, I've got to be honest. A lot of the bosses in this game, especially ones where they are all alone with no allies, they attack twice or sometimes three times in one round, which, you know, fair enough if they only attack individuals, but when they can also attack every member of the party, it can get a little tasty. This is one of those very few occasions where I went in slightly unprepared. I should have been way more careful with my health. So, Necklord has fled, you've partly accomplished your mission, and the rest of your team join you to tell you that South Window has fallen. The mayor killed. Highland has taken it, and soon they will be on their way here to secure all the regions in the area, including this new castle you just reprimanded. Oh yeah, by the way, despite all the misery guts talking right now, we have just claimed our castle. Where's the fanfare? Well, with the army on its way, it probably wouldn't be yours for too long, so I get it. But yeah, they essentially mixed the castle acquisition and the Necklord plot into one, which I think is a slightly cool twist. Because for me, it was unexpected. I was too distracted about the upcoming fight with Neki that I didn't even have the castle on my mind. Just a shame there was no celebration about the event. Anyways, Apple has an idea. Her idea is that she is not clever enough to help, but she knows someone who may be. Matthew's other former student, someone he expelled. The genius Shu. He is not far away, so let's go and try and persuade him to help us. So this shoe fella, he lives in Radat, and just like Matthew, he ain't willing to help you straight away. He enjoys his life as a successful trader. No matter what you try, he requests you to bugger off. He's one of those fellas who already knows what you're gonna say. There is a very strong arrogance about him, and he just keeps refusing. But there is a private detective in town who will do his best to find the dirt, find the best way for you to persuade him to your side. But he can only tell you that he's going to be making a big trade tonight at the docks. And that's when you should get his attention again. It still doesn't quite go to plan, but he says he'll consider it if you find the gold coin he throws in the river. He's a bit of a dick about it if I'm being honest. He talks down to Apple as though he's like a disappointed teacher. Apple wades in the freezing water looking for the coin. And you and Nanami help out too. All night looking for it. And yes, eventually he does finally join you. Who knew he'd be so needy? Well, he claims he's worth more than 100,000 troops. He sets out a plan to repel the Highland forces, steering the odds in your favor. And this time, this time the war battle has music! Hurrah! With an ambush from the side and enemy troops switching sides, you somehow overcome the odds. Eventually, they will retreat. This is the first time you've got a chance to take control of things for yourself even if the twists and turns are out of your hands. With Ryo, with Ryo leading the charge to take down the enemy general, he is lauded as a hero, with troops cheering. He's a hero! And now, he's been chosen as the leader of the army. This castle is ours. And you, the son of the state hero Genkaku, possessing the bright shield rune, as he also once did, you will be the leader of the army against the Highland. It's all a bit sudden, but destiny often is. That night, Victor decides to give you the lowdown on your father, or grandfather, let's just say adoptive guardian. Okay, father. To cut a long story short-ish, Genkaku was a hero of the Jostan state 30 years ago. He was the champion of Muse. He was from the same village as the lead general of the Highland army. They even had tea together on the battlefield when their armies met. They eventually came to peace. Except the mayor of Jostan didn't want that, and he refused to hand over one particular town. 
Eventually, they agreed each kingdom's champion would fight a duel to decide the winner, but Gengaku refused to fight. And thus the town was lost, Gengaku was shamed and exiled. But he did it for a good reason. His blade was secretly poisoned and he was in a lose-lose situation. If he won the duel, he'd be branded evil for doing something so dastardly. But in fact, it was the mayor of Muse who was frightened that Gengaku was more popular with the people. He wanted him out of the picture. Gengaku was a war hero, a peace hero whose name was wrongly tarnished. It's time to take up his mantle and you become the hero of Jostin. The first order of the day is to name the castle. Steenbok Castle is back baby. And guess who's back to be cryptic as hell? She is here to offer her congratulations and offers up two gifts, a stone tablet and Luke, her tosspot assistant. The exact same gifts she gave Tia in Suicoden 1. She's the kind of lady who brings a box of Ferrero Rocher to every dinner party. She has no originality. To be fair though, Luke is an absolute beast in this game and he should be in your party at all times. Now the castle is yours. It's not exactly developed, it's a bit of a mess and there aren't many people here yet, but you might as well give it a good look around because it's pretty big. It will take you a while to try and not get lost and remember where everything is. The more people you recruit, the more lively this place will become. Explore, get your bearings. This place is way more interesting than Suicoden 1's castle, and I really like that as well. Talk to the people. There's not only recruits, but just random people living here now. They always have something to say, whether it's important or not. There's so much world building in this game. I particularly enjoy talking to the doctor, Juan, who always seems fascinated by your bowels. Look, Rio is 17. He doesn't need a prostate exam. Put the lube away. Anyways, you're probably going to want to populate this place. And I don't mean via breeding, at least not right now, that's a bit too slow. So now is a good time to go out and get some breeders, I mean recruits, soldiers to join up. There should be plenty about now, and you'll spend a good hour or so just casually going through the towns and picking people up. And plot-wise, you're going to need to form alliances. You're technically a new state, now called the Smeg Army. Look, just because I called my company the Smeg Company, doesn't mean I want my whole army of Smeg. It's fine, I'll live with the consequences. You remember upon the hilltop when politics got strong? Well, those dudes, you probably want them all on your side. So first, take a boat westwards to Two Rivers. This is an interesting city. I guess there's some commentary on racial segregation because there are three settlements separated across two rivers. One for humans, one for the doggy kobolds, and one for a new species that we haven't been introduced to as of yet, wingers because they've got wings. What's wrong with calling them bat freaks? It is an interesting place for sure, where tensions run high between the three. Even the kobolds and the humans who have lived together for a long time, never mind the recently encamped wingers who are just refugees of sorts, they find it difficult to find a true place here. So they often resort to petty theft, like this kid Chaco who steals your wallet. Yeah, he's a snotty little knob, something every JRPG needs, but just like most of them, they come good in the end. Just for Chaco, it takes a while. He's a bit of a shit. He's nicked your introduction letter so you can't see the mayor. You've got to chase after him in this rickety little section of town. You know the kind of gimmick. You have to chase him down until you get him to a corner. If you find that annoying, well, uh, you have to do it twice because why not? Anyways, you don't get your letter back right then, but you end up seeing the messenger ready to get whipped by the leader of the kobolds over a misunderstanding. This is Ridley. He's a bit of a badass. Eventually you get your time with the mayor, but it's not a particularly happy one. There's too much feuding in this town. And even though you've just arrived, you are tasked with patching up relations. Unfortunately, kobolds refuse you entry into their part of the town. But that punk Chaco needs to be chased again. And this time he leads you into the sewer system. Don't call them a trope. It's only been four games in a row. This leads you to a mildly interesting dungeon with the cutest boss ever. Oh, I want it as a pet. Let's murder it first.
So there's an enemy plot to make the races distrust each other, and it appears to be working. Makai wants to surrender, nobody else does, but pulling together. The wingers come, led by Tarko, who wants to protect the town he loves, even if he's not really accepted here. The kobolds come, and the Smeg army comes all together to ward them off. It's a small segment within the game, but it is very memorable, showing the power of working together. The Highland retreat, and with that, you've gained a very strong ally in the fight. We then cut to a command tent within the Highland. Luca is reprimanding his general who failed to take Steenbot Castle and orders him to be executed for failure. And you'll see someone very familiar standing alongside Luca's staff, Joey. Joey is now part of Luca's team. What on earth is he doing? With the generals all scared of taking responsibility, he asks who will command an attack on Green Hill, another city in the state. The only one who responds is Joey. He says he can take it easy on pain of death. Despite the good news of gaining a new ally, yeah, it turns out Joey is quite the speedy little general, Green Hill has already fallen with only 5,000 men. It's an incredible achievement and there's no chance of claiming it back for the time being. But the mayor of Green Hill would be an incredible ally. If we can bust her out, it will give us a good chance of winning over the people and a greater chance of freeing Green Hill in the future. This is the point of the story where things have a little bit of a breather. Not in terms of important things happening, just the pace of the story. Things have been happening faster than we can even think. And the Green Hill mission is where we need to hit the brakes just a little bit. Every lengthy JRPG needs these moments. Moments where the grand plot goes small scale. If you remember in Skies of Arcadia, to cool down the pace a bit, you were stranded on a deserted island and had to survive, then try to grab some treasure to get back on your feet. It was a perfect interlude to wind down the pace just a bit. And Green Hill is basically that in Suikoden. Forget the war battles, forget traveling city to city and recruiting people, now you're going to school. Literally, Green Hill is a college town, as you Americans would put it. A famed academy lays within its borders. Naturally, if you're going undercover, you can only choose young companions, which is a nice restrictive twist. The only fully grown adult is Flick, who is designated as your guardian. I can imagine on repeated playthroughs, this part can get a bit tiresome because it's quite stop-start and takes place over the course of a few days, most of which concerns going to bed a lot and being woken up a lot. It's a shame you don't actually attend any sort of classes, you just walk around asking for information and following spooks. As you infiltrate this town, you're on the lookout for signs of Teresa. She's hiding out somewhere away from the Highland troops. Even Raud is here, now taking orders from Joey. There's a lot going on here, to be honest, and I'm going to skip over it a little bit, like helping Fitcher, Nina, who's in love with Flick, and the method Highland used to conquer this place. There's a lot going on. Eventually, you will spot Teresa's guard using a secret passage round the back, which leads to Teresa's hideout, but she is not willing to come with you. A majestic waste of time, I think you'll agree. At least were it not for the fact there's a tasty bounty on her head right now, which will no doubt mean someone's going to come forward. When General Joey appears to get people on their side, and Joey and Ryo come face to face before you leg it out. And if Teresa isn't willing to come now, well, you just gotta kidnap her. You basically go up and down the forest path way more times than is actually enjoyable, just to make Teresa realize her life is worth more than she knows. Just as you escape from the forest, someone is way ahead of you. Joey is a clever bugger and was waiting for you right there. He wants you to give up fighting. The war is already won, and more fighting just means more death. And Joey will do what he can to mediate the carnage caused by Luca. He is doing damage limitation, but Ryo and his army are getting in the way of that. Finally, some kind of explanation, but you still have to drag Nanami kicking and screaming. She's not believing it. As you finally escape, Joey even covers for you, saying he never saw you come this way, and a few Highland generals even back him up. They know what Joey's plans are, and they are ready to back him. The seeds of subterfuge have definitely been sown. It's at this point you are once again invited to explore the world, the towns and locations for many more recruits. 
You can get quite a few right now. Familiar faces like Hicks and Tengar, Meg, and a newcomer, the very lovable Gadget, who's a barrel robot. Doesn't make sense, but I like him. And after that, your castle should be expanded somewhat, looking much more clean and modern. Definitely have a look around. You'll probably have a bathhouse, a restaurant, a farm and such. Have a look, it's a wonderful place. In the meantime, you get a scene back with Luca and his generals. Joey is congratulated and Luca will hear what Joey's special request is. Joey wants to marry Luca's sister. Remember the lady in the tent? He wants to marry her and tells Luca straight to his face. Absolute Bobby Big Bollocks. Even the other generals are taken by surprise. Luca obviously wants to cut his head off right there and then, but Joey has a special idea he wants to bring up in private. I guess it's too private for our viewing. Yeah, we can see this, but we can't see Luca's quarters. This is selective plot spying and I don't appreciate it. I just want to see Luca in his pajamas. Is that so much to ask? Anyways, back to our viewpoint and Shu has decided our next focus should be on the Matilda Knights, a supposedly honorable people that as you can imagine are pretty handy with a sword. They are well north and so you may even be able to pincer Muse and Greenhill if you have them on your side. On your way there, you'll bump into the clumsy Vicky. You may remember her from the first game as the lady who can teleport you different places. She even teleports you back home by mistake. She's a girl full of mistakes. She is a powerful mage, but she has like a 5% chance of hurting your team rather than the enemy. Anyways, she's perfect for helping out hoover up some recruits, but not without an accompanying item to help us teleport back to the castle, not just away from it but that's still quite a bit away. You are greeted by Miklatov, the knight. Maybe you remember him from earlier. He assisted you in battle one time before retreating. He escorts you to Rock Axe Castle, where all the knights live. And you can be introduced to Lord Gerudo, a good old chunk of a man and a bit of an arrogant prick. You mean the leader of a realm of knights in an RPG is a bit of a knob? I don't believe you. He tells you, thanks for coming, now bugger off. In the middle of the night, sleeping with your sister, no comment, Lechnart returns to once again say you are the future. I don't get this bit since it's just random. Sure, you've been denied, but it's not as though you're, you're Nadia and you know she comes to lift your spirits. A fat old knight just told you to jog on, whoop de do. There is a bit of a commotion in the morning, with Highland troops rocking up to the border. Not to invade, at least not yet, but instead they are pursuing refugees fleeing Muse. Sweet Golden 2 turns into a bit of a fetish snuff film at this point because as the Highland close in on the refugees and murder them, the knights just watch on behind their walls. Making a light-hearted quip about the slaughter of thousands of innocent refugees, that's a tough one, not gonna lie, even for me. But hey, at least the Matilda knights, they were respectful. They didn't bring any popcorn, even though I'm sure the fat guy at the back probably had it on his mind. It's clear Gerudo isn't exactly pleasing his knights. He may not be benevolent, but Miklatov and Kamas are. They are hurt by what's happening and will have to go against his orders. Miklatov wants to go undercover to Muse to see what's happening with his own eyes. And with him, you go. Now here's the part of the video I like to call Why oh why did you forsake me Elgato? And Elgato is not some sort of Aztec God, it's a piece of equipment and software that helps me record video game stuff. Because for some technical bullshittery reasons, quite a healthy chunk of footage was lost. And although I did have protective safe states to account for stuff like this, let's just say they didn't quite align in my favour. I'm a busy guy and I can't be replaying two hours worth of a game, sorry, especially when it's not missing too much, at least in regards to the main story. So firstly, between Muse and Rock Axe, there's a shitty little village where there's a side quest with Futch and Humphrey from the first game. It is quite a tough side quest where you climb up a mountain and Futch finds a baby dragon. You may remember his previous dragon was killed three years ago. It's a fairly nice mission, one of the better side quests in the game and very easily missable. You must do this side quest like right now, otherwise you will miss it and you will not get Humphrey or Futch. Which is a shame because Humphrey is a bit of a beast. His defense is as solid as me during the introduction of Lilu in the fifth element. Mila Jovovich fans, you know. The big thing that went missing is what I would like to call supernatural oh shittery. I don't have a video, I could just nick someone else's on YouTube and pretend it's mine, but I'm better than that. As someone who is artistically ungifted, 
I'm going to recreate what happened in the missing footage. You walk up to it, this is Muse by the way, but there is some funky nonsense quivering in the air. Then suddenly, there's a dark magic tornado, which grows a wolf head. I can't draw wolves very well. Then it gets a second head, and then it does a Chewbacca, rawr, and then it disappears. Then you go to the city and it's empty. The citizens have been spirited away, no doubt working as slave labor in bathhouses. Luke is at the top laughing his ass off with Joey next to him. That's Luca, by the way. This Joey, obviously. And that's about it. Miklatov goes back to the knights. The leader doesn't give her monkeys, tries to arrest Miklatov, but half of the knights in the realm stand up for him, and then many of them follow you out back to your castle. If you've read the rule book, it says, if you can't get an alliance, at least steal half of their soldiers. And that's what we've done here. And tomorrow, the Highland are coming again. This time, with a pretty mean opponent. Leon Silverberg, Matthew's uncle, and a formidable strategist. He was your ally in Suicoden 1, he's your enemy in Suicoden 2. Maybe. He's not on the front lines yet, so you're meeting Kiba and his son Klaus head on. But there's discontent in your ranks. The Kobold leader, Ridley, is unhappy his troops have been put on the front lines, as though Kobolds are more expendable than humans. And Ridley retreats his forces, and therefore it's a no-go for a win. You have to retreat the whole army because of it. In the meantime, we get a cutscene of Joey getting married to Jillia, at least getting permission from the king. The wedding will come later. But before that can happen, Joey needs to take an oath that all of the knights here take. The king will drink a bit of your blood as proof of loyalty. The king is dead, poisoned by his own son and Joey working together. A risky plan for Joey's own health, but he survives and Highland has a new king, the Mad King Luca Blight. There's even some family secrets uttered, Agares wasn't actually Jillia's biological father, with the insinuation she was a birth as a result of a rape, where the king failed to protect his wife. This is one hell of a moment, a lot to process, there's a new king, and now Joey will be related to Luca as a brother-in-law. This gets more and more messed up, and it's just glorious. Anyways, the situation at hand, Kiba's striking you this time, and it's time to ambush him. They know a trap is coming from the tree line, but they feel they can deal with it. But Shu, he's a good old egg, and he set a trap within a trap. The ambush goes ahead, but a second ambush comes as the Kobold warriors return. Ridley's dissatisfaction was a ploy all along, and Kiba is completely surrounded. He's a general known for his impeccable defensive strategy, so he takes an absolute age to whittle down his troops. And now you have him and his strategist son in captivity. With news of the king's death trickling in, it's an easy choice for Kiba and his son to switch sides. They were loyal to King Agares, not his insane son Luca. And although reluctant, like most reasonable generals in the series, they turn coat to the Smeg army. After recruiting some more allies, including a unicorn and a griffin, seriously, a meeting occurs where people are waiting for you. But sorry, recruitment is more important. Apparently we've sort of ran out of allies to ask, that is until someone who may be familiar with you drops in to say we should ask his old man, Sheena. I always remember Sheena because one, he's a boy called Sheena and two, it's literally only one of two times I've seen the name Sheena, the other one being one of the Ramones best songs, Sheena is a punk rocker. You've all heard of it and if you haven't, you need an education. 
So, I've always remembered this dude in the first game, and I literally can't stop Sheena is a punk rocker playing in my head during his brief moments in that game. He's a bit more masculine this time around, so yeah, definitely a boy. Ridley, though, doesn't believe he's important, despite genuinely being the son of the president of the Toran Republic. And... <laughs> no. No, they didn't! Gotta be on purpose. With that embarrassment out of the way, Sheena says you should ally yourself with the Toran Republic, something almost unthinkable due to the previous empire being enemies of the state. But you know, the regime has changed, Toran Republic is run by good people now, and you, you are going to head there in person. You are going to Gregminster. You are going to the setting of the first game. Remember that moment in Pokemon Gold and Silver when the map moved over and you saw the Kanto region? This is almost that level. But yeah, it is a long trek there by boat and then by foot over mountains, going through backwater town, through forests. It's almost painful how long it takes to get there. But this is the tease. If you've played Suicoden 1 before, this is when you start tingling with excitement. You'll get to the border guards, now protected by Varkus, an old ally in Suicoden 1. Sadly, he doesn't have a portrait, which is a bit disrespectful, but whatever. And he will take you to Gregminster. Ho oh, ho, nostalgia overflow. In the very room, Suicoden 1 began. I mean, I thought the entire castle crumbled in the finale, but whatever. You meet up with Lepant, now president of the Toran Republic. Apparently, Tyr is missing just as we witnessed during the ending. Despite fending off invasions from the north previous years, Lepant sees glimmers of hope in your eyes and grants you a small battalion of Toran troops, 5,000 men and one general, either Valeria or Kasumi. Two prominent figures in the first game, but you can only choose one. It doesn't change too much, so uh, yeah, Valeria is an absolute beast and Kasumi is named after an Atari Jaguar game. Which dollop of awesome do you want? Actually, the only real change, I think, is that they can get different characters to join earlier. Like, Kasumi gets the ninja clan to join up way earlier, so yeah, ninjas are the way to go for me. At this point, with your alliance complete, you can return back to Joston, or hang around in Gregminster a little bit longer, and you get the Blinking Mirror, an item that was a godsend in the first game, meaning you can teleport back to the castle from anywhere on the world map. Personally, I would advise hanging around a bit first, because one, it's a massive pain in the ass to get back here. You can't teleport to Gregminster. You always have to walk. And there are recruits waiting for you right here. And memories. Sweet, sweet memories. Let the nostalgia seep in. Sadly, you can't walk outside of Gregminster, but it's enough. Just wander around, talk to people, see how the Toran Republic has changed for the better. Even see some old faces, even though they don't have faces, because, yeah, they don't have any character portraits anymore. Anyways, getting nostalgia out of the way, we may have help, but so do the enemy, who still outnumber us with double the troops. You wake up in the middle of the night with Ailey in your bedroom. Oh yeah, you two getting cozy, even though it's not even really mentioned in the plot. You dirty dog, keeping it on the side. Speaking of dogs, Ridley, once again, all up in the controversy, during a scouting mission, his unit had been surrounded, and he needs to be rescued. I believe it's almost impossible, but not to worry, he's probably fine, I think. Ridley is a weird character because I believe there are different outcomes for his fate, depending on different things that you do. He definitely can die, and uh, will be replaced by his son, but I'm not sure if that happens here or not. Anyways, I'm rambling, which ain't great for a video this long. You retreat, and Ridley is face to face with Luca, and he gets all the dog puns he can get in. Mongrel, bow as in bow wow. I mean, you wouldn't be able to help yourself, would you? You look like you've had a rough day. The Highlander coming to try and finish you off once again, now they have so many men and a new strategist. But good old Shu, he's got a plan. Just go for the head of Luca. As though it's easy enough not to be noticed by 50,000 soldiers, Anyways, you lure him in, then what I would like to describe as 
We don't know how to worm ourselves out of this one storytelling. Luca teleports off and all your units are damaged. Because... Yeah. Anyways, you retreat and Ridley comes back rescued by Chaco who is very useful wing little freak. The message comes from Leon Silverberg himself, warning Shu that Luca is planning a night raid on the castle. Why is Leon helping you? This story just gets more and more fascinating as it goes on. It could be a trap, but the reward seems worth the risk. And this is where things get a little weird. Shu tells you to select the party you think can take him on head to head. You do that, but then he has you to select a second party and then a third party. By which point, you're shitting yourself because as you get to the last slithers of characters, you realise they're going to be gingerbread men against Luca. You feel a bit guilty that you've neglected them so much. They are not levelled enough to take on Luca. But you are preparing for one of the most badass, unbelievable scenes in gaming history. Don't mess it up. Luca is making his way through the forest, boasting about his chances. And, uh... Holy, this is epic. Yeah, I'm gonna get mullered. I've got a friggin' squirrel in my team against Luca Blight. He is a monster. He attacks three times in a round and they are painful. And yeah, down. Okay, I really was hopelessly unprepared for this. Wait a minute. Oh, it's one of them fights. All right. Luca tries to get away, but Team 2 jumps in. I'm feeling a bit more confident this time around, but I'm not pulling any punches. Who knows what's going on under the hood of this game? Team 2 with Victor leading the charge. Team 2 is down. It's time for the final team. I'm pretty confident. I guess I don't need to win this one either. Let's do that again. He is one tough bastard. You really have to throw the kitchen sink at him. Until finally, finally, he gives in. The monster is down. Except he's not. He runs away and you have to chase after him. And he's still got troops protecting him. Alone and wounded, he saunters up to a tree with a glowing box. He's going even madder than usual. He's delusional. That box. He opens it up to see fireflies inside. It's beautiful but a ploy.
Oh my god. You have almost got to respect the sheer resilience this man has. He's down to the last inch of his power before a final duel. The Mad King is dead. This is hands down one of the most epic moments in gaming. And Joey was behind it all. A brutal, vicious end to one of the most vicious gaming villains of all time. It's time to party! Or it would be if uh, Rio didn't collapse. Such a party pooper. Luca is genuinely dead, and Joey and Julia are married, and that means Joey is the king of Highland. It sounds nonsensical, it sounds impossible, but it's perfectly built up and considered. With that over, it's time to have a breather. Where can the plot possibly go on from here? The awesomeness isn't slowing down because although we're going to be doing a side quest, it's one of the best side quests ever. Now that Luca is down, head back to the village near the border of Torren, a sleepy little fishing village. If you loaded your Suicode and one save data up at the beginning and you completed the 108 stars in that game, two rather special people will be there waiting for you, or at least hiding from you. One of the young kids in town tells you, Ryo, that he has seen General Ryo in town, but he's hiding away. He wants to get his attention by pretending to be lost in the woods. You go ahead with the plan, but genuinely, the kid ends up getting taken by bandits. Desperate for help, the General Ryo and his aide, Gremio, come to help. Wait, 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 what? What? It turns out that the kid was mistaken, obviously. It wasn't Ryo, it was Tia from Suicoden 1. Chilling out the back fishing! This is one of the best callbacks ever, because Tia, the badass hero from Suicoden 1, is joining you to get the kid back. Tia is in your party, and he's tanked up with his soul eater rune. It's a simple quest, but so gratifying. It's like shaking hands with the past, and you feel so safe with this dude in your party. Firstly, He's not a star of destiny in this game, he's not required, it's almost like a secret bonus. But if you finish this side quest, Tia will head back to Gregminster, back home to visit for a time. But if you walk all the way there to Gregminster, you can add him to your party. Seriously, Tia can be in your party. Sadly, if the party gets disbanded for plot reasons, you have to trek all the way back there again. So I didn't use him too much, but he is a ferocious warrior, physically and magically, and this is the perfect closure to Suicoden 1. I know there's a lot of derision for endless nostalgia callbacks these days in media. It's an easy emotional target to say, remember that? But it works just so well here, perhaps more for me than for others. You know, I've played Suicoden 1 countless times, this one less so. So perhaps there's more emotional weight to this than say someone who played the original once and then went straight into Suicoden 2. But it's the closure I personally needed. But enough about this, because despite the king being dead, long live the new king. You get a message from Joey asking you to attend Hilltop to try and negotiate a treaty. It's probably going to be a trap, but you want to face Joey anyways. You might as well go. Good news, Muse is still empty of life. Good, I'm sick of overcrowded cities here in China. Chaco goes off on his own and you make the awkward run up to the meeting room seeing Joey and Leon. There, there's some awkward conversation. You know, like you've not seen your best mate in a couple of years and you need to catch up in a couple of sentences. One guy's like, well, yeah, me and Ginny finally put down money for a mortgage. We adopted a cat from the shelter and I finally started my online teaching degree. And then the other guy's just like, uh, I just became king. Uh, y you know, I, I, I married into the family. I plotted the deaths of the two previous kings and one thing led to another. How's your mother? Nice to see you again. Joey or Leon ain't down for peace actually, they just want you to surrender. 
Apparently, Joey thinks a treaty isn't enough for true peace. The world is too complicated. And if you don't, these crossbows will be firing in your direction. Well, it's supposed to be Joey saying that, but, uh, you know, I'll get to the iffy translation stuff in a bit. Again and again, you are pleaded to surrender. Joey is as desperate as me when my girlfriend broke up with me at the tram stop in Sheffield City Centre. Not my most dignified moment. But Victor is here to the rescue. Shu had a plan B, and when things go awry, what should one do? Let's use children as a meat shield. Victor brings Pilika, the only person who could possibly break the barrier to Joey's heart. There's no way he could fire with her around. She's seen enough. And with that, you leg it out, leaving the young girl behind. It is almost despicable, but it is for the best. Joey can actually take care of her. It's what they both wanted, and you escape with your life. It's win-win. Plus, she'll get to be a princess as well, so it's all good. And she's finally able to speak again. With Chaco opening the city gate, you run out alive. With that out of the way, we have another distraction, this time from Tinto, a part of the Jostan state that refused to even entertain the idea of teaming up with you. They wouldn't even let you in. But bandits from the region have come asking for your help. Zombies have been infesting the area, and the bandit kid wants you to go help them. Zombies must mean Necklord, and Necklord cannot be allowed to get a foothold in Tinto. That would be a strategic disaster for the Smeg army. So with you leading a small team across the border to Tinto, you gotta see what all this fuss is about. It is a long journey with plenty of towns along the way. I'm not gonna dwell on this part since it doesn't advance the main plot too much, but it is home to one of the best enemies, not only in this game, but perhaps in any JRPG. Vampire Lady! And not just one, this place is a paradise for them. She even has a little jiggle. I don't want to sound like I'm from the mid 2000s, but damn, suddenly vampires seem really cool. So what's the story? This mining town has always been very distant from dealing with you, but zombies have started infesting the areas in the mines. And so Gustav, with the magnificent eyebrows, asks for help eventually. With Smeg army reinforcements called for, you have to wait it outside a bit, but the neck boy has come to visit. In fact, He's pleasant enough to ask you kindly to leave rather than murdering you. He wants to make his kingdom right here. One of the things about this section is that Nanami asks you to give up and run away with her. She's mentioned it a few times before and you can actually agree with her if you want to. This changes the story a little bit if you say yes, but I'll explain more about that later. Anyways, when you're exploring the mine, you come across Necklord who's trying to sneak into the city around the back. He knocks you flat out, of course. There's only you and an army. She pulls you to safety, and the zombies have already infested the town. You wake up in a nearby village, and you find out that Tinto was completely taken over. You're going to need something really special to stop Necklord. And thankfully, Khan appears. Now, with more knowledge about how to take him out properly. Yes, what do you need? You need another vampire. Why? Well, my theory, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but my theory is the writer, they want to add an extra layer of storytelling and lore into the Sui Coding universe by adding a really cute vampire girl to your party. It's just a theory. Can you feel the lore adding? Sierra, conveniently, is nearby. She's one of my favorite characters. She's powerful. She knows she's way above these human meatbags, and you have to fight her first to prove yourself. She wants to retrieve Necklord's Moon Rune, which he stole from the Vampire Clan. With Victor's sword, Khan's knowledge, and Sierra's power, Necklord can be stopped once and for all, and you go for his head in Tinto, right at the top. And don't worry, he's not nearly as scary as the first game. He should be a, a mild test. But before you even press a single attack, listen. Listen to the goddamn music. Because Necklord's battle theme is epic. Soak that bad boy into your ears. Best track in the game bar none, and it's a shame it's only used here. And if you're powered up too much, you might not hear it for long, so please enjoy it. 
Necklord is ended for good, finished off by the Star Dragon Sword. The town is safe once more and now is allied with the Smeg army. Up till now you've always been on the back foot, but now you're on equal number terms. It's time to go on the attack. But the night before the attack, a seeming trope of Suikoden, at least in the first two games, an assassin. A lady is waiting in your bedroom to take you out. And what's the most stealthy weapon an assassin can use? A whip. Nothing quite says undetectable ninja like cracking the sound barrier. No one's gonna notice. Anyways, she's a recurring character in this game and in later games. I won't dwell on her too much, but she's a vengeful lady who's perhaps slightly misdirected. She's not bad at heart, just, uh, you know, don't poison people's fathers, eh? Hey? Okay, it's time to take back Green Hill. Interestingly, you can choose one of two battles to take part in. I chose to block the enemy reinforcements, and when that's done, you have to infiltrate Green Hill from a secret path to open up the gate for our army. That means walking through the forest again. Yeah, I could have done without this part. You battle Lucia, the whipping assassin, until you get to the front of Green Hill, and you're greeted by Uber, the general for hire. I'm guessing he hired a cab to Green Hill. He's called Yuba. Taxi, Yuba. I'll rework that joke later. Despite looking badass and apparently having inhuman powers, he's not really been much of a test in the series, and you don't get to fight him 1v1 here because he summons a giant bone dragon. What is it with dead dragons in Suikoden? Anyways, this is supposed to be one of the toughest bosses in the game, but it didn't prove too taxing for me. Having Luke, Sierra and George, an absolute beast of a character, really helped out. Anyways, taxi for you, but... That's still not working. I'll try one more time later. Moving on, Green Hill is liberated. Let's keep the momentum going. Or I would, but this is kind of the last time you can recruit people. If you go any further, you risk missing out on the true ending by recruiting too late. So yeah, hoover up everyone. The Blacksmith, the Swordmaster, Pez Merger, Yuba's arch nemesis. It's never really explained why they hate each other, but my theory is it's because Pez Merger always talks behind his back. Because he's a taxi driver, Yuba. Talking behind his, his back. I'm really trying. Anyways, the Matilda Knight surrendered to Highland, but Muse is left unguarded. At least not as much as before, so let's crack on with this war! Invading Muse seems almost too easy. When you arrive in the city, it's once again deserted. Except for golden wolves! It's all a bit chaotic and enemy reinforcements come, meaning Muse is out of reach. A failed attack, and a new plan must be drawn. This time, against the Matilda Knights, and it's going to be the final chance to succeed. The fate of the war depends on the success of this fight. Great sacrifices will be made, and it's going to take a cunning plan. A distraction heading east, and the main force going north to take on the knights. A two-wave attack. Before it goes ahead, a meeting is called in the, well, the meeting room, where the stars of destiny gather together. As you inspire those around you, Miss Cryptic appears once again, and should confirm you have collected all the recruits, and opens up your final attacking spell. After the war battle, you have to sneak into Rockhack's castle and replace the flag. Burning down their flag and replacing it with the Smeg army flag, the enemy soldiers outside the castle will think their fight is lost and they'll either flee or surrender. That's a solid plan. Only a crack team could do this and boy, is this when the story gets even tastier. We've got ourselves a castle dungeon. There's even multiple layers and, I believe, different routes to take to the end. It's a great setup for a brilliant upcoming cutscene. A cutscene that can change the face of the ending. As you make your way to the top, you'll be stopped in your tracks once again by Joey. With only you and Nanami together for the final push, it is a tense moment. Nanami hates, hates the fight that they have to fight and can't understand why. Joey. Joey just wants to have one dominant state where there can be no feuds, no jealousy, no corruption, or false allegiances. Only then will the land be free. Before the fight begins, Fatboy Knight takes advantage of the situation and plans to kill both you and Joey together. Two birds, one stone. Or one arrow, or probably two hour, hour whatever. As the archers prepare to fire, your big sister steps up.
Oh my god. Nanami is wounded. And you and Joey team up to take down the Backstreet Boys. This is epic because you and Joey are well and truly overpowered Mother Hubbards right now. And Joey's Black Sword rune is just terrifyingly strong. You're already dreading having to face him later on. Anyways, this is such an easy fight, but that's not the point. It's a weird moment in a game with so many ups and downs. With him down, we see Joey's more caring side, but he can't bear to stay here any longer. And Ryo and Nanami have a moment together. Yikes. It may be too late, but backup is here. Nanami is brought to Doctor, the flags are changed, and victory is assured. But did we lose her? Apparently, yeah. Nanami is dead. That's a lot to process. Your big sister Nanami is dead. The only one who's been with you throughout this game. If she didn't force her way into your party, you probably chose her anyways, just because she's so fun and livable and truly the heart of the story. The reluctant fighter, but always wanting to protect her brother. Even though they're not blood related, she's always been there for you, protected you, cared for you. And now, she is dead. But Shu, ever the practical strategist, there's no time for grieving, because Joey suffered a huge loss even pulling out a muse, they are completely out of Jostan territory, back to their capital city to regroup. The advantage must be pressed. Grieving is for later. It's time to eliminate Highland once and for all. Just like Joey wanted to stamp out any possible resistance later, you need to do the same thing for them. Highland must be obliterated. It's all just too much for Ryo, and he faints for the second time in as many hours. Meanwhile, in Highland, something funky is going on. The troops' morale needs to be increased, so they want to awaken the Beast Rune, the menacing rune that's trapped within their capital. Unleash a horrific beast to wipe their enemies from this land, and Joey uses his wife as a sacrifice. Thankfully, it's all just a propaganda trick. And it was just a doll, not his real wife. But hey, if it boosts their morale, it's worth a shot. Let's push on and take down Highland once and for all. Firstly, Leon needs to be taken care of. Shu's master's uncle is a clever old bugger who knows the strategy books like the back of his hand. So it's time to throw the book out of the window and break the rules. Drawing in their forces and unleashing a burning inferno around himself, Shu fully intends to sacrifice himself. The one thing Leon would never have expected. And you're thinking to yourselves, we got ourselves another Matthew. The strategist dying during the last fight. But no. Bait and switch, Victor managed to pull him out of the fire. A nice little twist. With Leon demolished the capital city, the final war battle. You just need to get one unit inside the castle. Pretty easy as are most of the war battles here. There is a new face though, Hans. Which if you've got any kind of memory was briefly mentioned about an hour or so ago. It, it's fine, I'll talk about him a bit later. It's the last hurrah for the kingdom. Colgan and Seed, which sounds like a buddy cup TV show. Lucia and even Yuba who then decides it's game over and pisses off. He came all the way here with great expectations and left with nothing to show for it. 
Nothing to show for it. Chauffeur. He's a chauffeur. He's a taxi driver. Chauffeur. Show for it. If you enjoyed that pun, please let me know in the comments. I really hope he doesn't show up in any more games, or at least Uber Taxis goes bust by the time I get there. It's an easy enough battle because th they almost all are. With enemy lines broken, the final push to the throne room begins. But there's someone I need to grab beforehand. Someone who will make this last push a bit more special. I'm bringing Tia along. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that due to a programming mistake, his name is almost always wrong. It takes the first letter of whatever name you gave him in your Suicode and one file, and then it uses it to replace the first letter of his family name. So if you named him Tia, which is his canon name, he'll be called Tukdol rather than Mukdol or Tia. Anyways, now with two heroes of destiny, it can't be too tough, right? Well, this is a huge dungeon. It's room after corridor after forked road. I'm surprised I actually made it through without getting lost too much. There are still some people standing in your way, however. Firstly, Lucia, who eventually sees reason after reconciling with Teresa, the person she had the most beef with. Apparently her father was poisoned by Teresa's father. It's a bit complicated. She kind of reminds me of a Twi'lek from Star Wars. Is that just me? Then we have Han, who, uh, yeah, this dude was your father's mate and also the opposing enemy general. They had tea together and they also had a duel that Genkaku refused to fight him because he knew it was a setup. This dude was also the previous owner of the Black Sword Rune, the opposite of the Bright Shield Rune. How and why they had that and how they managed to stop carrying them, I have no idea. I thought it was like a tattoo. Once you had it, it's there for good. Not sure they had laser removal technology in the Suicoden world. Anyways, it's a duel, and this is the toughest one of the game, since he's not easily giving his move away. But you should be okay. And finally, the penultimate bosses are Kogan and Seed. Just thinking about this like buddy cop TV show, I think Kogan would be the hard-boiled detective. He's been on the force 15 years, once a bright, enthusiastic investigator, but the harsh reality of the darkness of human nature has embittered him to the point of not caring anymore. But then in comes Seed, an extrovert. He's not really a police officer, he's a botanist who happened to get caught up in a murder where all the evidence pointed to him. But using his botany expertise, he proved he was innocent. He opens up Kogan to the goodness in people and then somehow solves every single crime with something to do with plants and biology and botany. It's a work in progress. This is a cool fight as the game has been building up to it since the first hour. You've crossed paths with these guys so many times and you've been waiting for the moment to give them a good hiding. Again, they're probably not too much of an issue if you've got a strong party. It entirely depends on who you pick. I just wanted to get the job done, so assemble the team that could take on the Avengers. Or at least the B team. They are down. And they die trying to protect their country. They were certainly not bad men. Just like so many of the so-called enemies in this game. But you know, war is a silly thing. And then we cut to Joey and Pilika. Instead of preparing to fight Ryo, Joey is preparing to send his wife and Pilika off to escape to another kingdom in the north. Live a secret new life, away from the war and away from retribution. He says goodbye to his family. Strolling up to your encounter, Joey is in fact not there. But Leon, Leon summons the Beast Rune. He tests you to destroy it once and for all so it can't devour the souls of anyone else. This is the final boss. It's one head less than the Golden Hydra of Suicoden 1, but I guess this is only a kingdom, not an empire. Budgets must be adhered to. This actually has five things to aim at, and it's all going to be massively confusing and bewildering about which ones you should be attacking, but my advice is take out the leg that heals first. Once that's done, maybe the leg that gives out status effects like candy, and then, well, just go to town on it. It is a long, long fight. The beast is resistant to most magic, and each appendage has a lot of health, so I hope you rationed your health restoration magic. You will be needing them if you're going to make it through. It will seem tense, 
but it is very doable, and it feels less troublesome than Luca did, it's just longer. And eventually, the beast will fall, and the game is done. Joey's kingly robes lay on the throne, indicating he has fled, and the castle begins to crumble. Your allies stand around you and advise you to get the frig out. He speaks! He has a voice! It's worth it for that alone! Legging it out of the castle, Ryo does a nice little game of zigzag on the lawn, because why wouldn't you? And you automatically pop out of the exit, much to the celebration of everyone. It's over. The war is finally over. You wake up in bed and are told the leaders from around the country are awaiting you in the meeting room. It's time to start rebuilding your country. Or at least, that's what the chumps would do. Because if you want the true ending, you've got to ignore them. Because there's someone who's still missing. Joey. Where is Joey? Well, remember 32 hours ago when you made a promise to each other on top of a mountain? Yeah. Well, walking up a very different looking mountain path in the daytime with no troop tents, all the way to the top where you made that promise to return. This is where the journey began for both you and Joey. And this is where it's going to end. He explains more about his reasoning. He felt if he was strong, he could create a better world. Now, you can fight him to the death. You can kill him if you want to. He has sinned. Perhaps he deserves it. Or you can choose not to fight. You can choose to hold back as he tries to get you to fight. He's almost angry that you won't humor him in a battle. There's no reason to fight anymore. But again, he initiates the duel. But keep defending. Do not fight back. Eventually, he will collapse from overexerting himself. Ever since he gained the Black Sword rune, which he heroically used to keep Luca in check with his Beast rune. The Shield rune and the Sword rune finally come back together to make the rune of beginning. And Joey eventually realizes, although he has no place in this country anymore, maybe he can go to a new land and do something positive in the world. Together with Ryo. And, well, Shu. Shu is there waiting for you to tell you a bit of a surprise. Nanami is alive. After being struck by the arrow, she could have died, but if you reacted quickly enough, she survives. But she wanted out. She was tired of the fighting, especially having to see Joey and Ryo fighting each other. And, you know, being so close to Ryo, she was a liability. To be so close at such an important moment of the war, she had to go home. She had to be distant from Ryo and also recover. And together with both Joey and an army wanting to get away, it is time to leave this country. Traveling here and there to Harmonia to see how Joey's wife's doing and Pilika. But that's, that's enough. Once again, off to a distant land. The hero of the nation can't stay and watch it grow. It's almost like destiny. And then, the best of Suikoden, the roll call. What everyone did after the war. This time interspliced with the footage of the trio's new adventures and how the country is doing now. It's a nice slow burn, you're able to take it all in and the music playing over it is very melancholy, as though you're almost sad that it's over. And you probably are, although the music does cut out halfway through, which is a running theme of this version of the game, kind of ruins the mood somewhat. And then the final image of the Tonfers and staff before we get a more upbeat credit sequence.
And once again, the myth, the legend, the monkey funky is back. Which I think we'll all agree is the biggest shock reveal of this game. Forget Joey switching sides, forget the king being poisoned, the monkey funky is back. What a comeback, what a reveal. And there we have it. Sui Coden 2. A story of war, of political intrigue, of childhood friends becoming leaders of opposing countries and going toe to toe. It's an unbelievable ride. Sui Coden 2 is a magnificent game. It has so many good things going for it. But it's not perfect, no matter what people say. And I do have a couple of mild to middlingly big complaints about it. And I want to get those out of the way first before I start all gushing about it and our trousers get all too sticky too early, okay? Nobody wants that. The one thing that's always stuck with me about criticisms of the original game is the translation. It is wonky and at times it has like random gibberish, but yeah, I personally never thought it was overly egregious. Just a few moments of charm, shall we say. And people who always bang on about Final Fantasy VII's supposedly bad translation, which again, aside from that one famous line, isn't really that bad. And Skies of Arcadia, people moaning about the translators just doing whatever the frig they like, with raging success, I may add. But Suicoden 2, oh boy, Suicoden 2 takes the biscuit. The amount of errors or gibberish is bewildering. It really almost took me out of what is an absolutely fantastic story. Now I'm not going to be showing every specific example because I ain't scouring through 32 hours worth of footage to have this moan. That's below my pay grade, it's below anyone's pay grade, you'll just have to trust me or just play it yourself, you'll see. I don't know what went wrong, but I have my theories. Theory number one, they just didn't have a lot of time. This game has an unbelievable amount of text. The sheer number of NPCs, just descriptions, and even like Richard's little secret things. It's an overwhelming amount of things to translate, and it wouldn't surprise me if most of the translation was done out of context, which never helps. They just had to rush through it and hope to get the job done in time. Which makes sense because it starts out not too bad, but you can gradually see it deteriorate over the course of the game. My second theory is that there were two translators, one really good one, and then one who did the work when this guy went for a cigarette break. Which he did about two thirds of the way through. You can see the exact moment he lit up when the game changed the spelling of Joey's name. He started selling historical simulation strategy games after this. While it does have its great moments, there are just way too many errors with wrong tenses, referring to the wrong people, the wrong people speaking, utterly bizarre phrasing and general nonsense that did its best to ruin what is an incredible, intriguing war story. I was not expecting this at all. Obviously, as a younger lad, I probably didn't notice it a whole lot, but now as a fully fleshed adult, at least mentally, my height would have a word with that, now I can see it, and it did bother me a lot. Since I started writing this, I saw that there's a fan-made patch specifically for the translation, which I wish I would have known about before playing, I'd have probably enjoyed it even more. And this is one of the things that I'm hopeful for with the HD remaster, because they have, they have to do a new translation. There's no way this would be acceptable in a re-release. And fingers crossed they don't change the good stuff, because what is good is really, really good. But there's just too many errors that should be adjusted. And for God's sake, why are the shops not capitalized? <laughs> the second problem I have, the war battles. Unlike the localization issues, I kind of saw this coming because I remember the war battles and I always remembered liking Suicoden 1's war battles more, despite how simple they were. Suicoden 1 is a simple case of rock, paper, scissors, basically because they come, but they're adorable and kind of tense. Suicoden 2 takes the gameplay up a notch to something more akin to Fire Emblem. Great, you're thinking. Except of the 15 war battles you have, you only do something meaningful in about three of them. The vast majority are scripted with little need for your input. And even when you do have some input, usually battles will suddenly end due to plot reasons. And even getting to those plot reasons is just slow. There's almost no time to spread your wings or fully take advantage of the potential it could have as a separate game mode. Perhaps it was supposed to be more open for you originally, but when playtesting they realized, well, it's kind of boring, it's slow as hell, your troops have no space to fart, and when you attack you're probably going to miss. Instead of you making slogs through, they thought, hey, maybe we should speed up the process and take your hands off altogether. It's best to think of these more like cutscenes than gameplay, and that makes it somewhat better. 
but yet for me, they missed the mark in terms of interesting gameplay. It doesn't help that due to bugs, the North American version, half of them are completely silent. No music plays in most of them. Talk about sucking the soul out of an epic battle. It just goes to show how important music can be for games. It's quite annoying that they even implemented a squad customization thing. When you talk to Apple, you can select who goes with which commanders. It's super limited, but it always gave me hope that when I got further in, maybe it will open up a bit more into something special. But no, it's just kind of pointless and disappointing. You don't need to use it at all. And this is at least one thing I can say is completely better in Suicoden 1. You can argue all you like that Suicoden 1 did war battles infinitely better, even if they were super simple. And those two things, those are the two major complaints I have about Suicoden 2. I want to stress that they didn't ruin the game for me or anything, but they certainly stopped it reaching JRPG perfection like I was really hoping for. And yeah, even though I'm stubborn as hell, and I like being the odd one saying like Suicoden 1 more, I was really genuinely hoping to have the JRPG of a lifetime. I mean, it's still a masterpiece with flaws, one of which is easily fixable in the remaster. So what makes it a masterpiece? Well, without a doubt, it's story. So let's get into that. I know you'll grow tired of me comparing it to Suicoden 1, but I do think the original, although almost a test run for this magnum opus, deserves some bigging up. Suicoden 2's story is great, amazing. It's the best asset of the game. But it has almost the same amount of holy shit epic moments as Suicoden 1, which packs punch after punch into 15 hours. Suicoden 2 stretches that to 30 hours. I don't think anything in Suicoden 2 tops the oh my god moment that you killed your father, or the heart wrenching moment that Matthew falls at the final battle. It is super close though. Like Joey stabbing Annabelle certainly woke me up. The King being killed, and of course Joey being primarily responsible for the death of Luca Blight, at least leading him into a trap which is possibly one of the greatest scenes in the game, perhaps one of the greatest scenes in gaming history, as long as you're prepared for it unlike myself, and Joey becoming King himself. And yeah, the game is, is full of great scenes. Nanami getting shot was definitely really aching, but perhaps slightly expected, especially with her surviving with the 108 stars. You could probably see that coming if you played the original. That is, of course, if you did that quick time event to make sure she survived. Yeah, I'll talk about that later. What Suicoden 2 did amazingly is that this one felt like a proper meaty adventure. A fully fleshed out world with lore treaded in, with much more to open up in the future. In comparison, Suicoden 1 is almost like a prologue. While that is epic in its own right, it feels like Suicoden 2 is the main event. If Suicoden 1 was The Hobbit, Suicoden 2 is The Lord of the Rings. And I feel like that's a good comparison because, you know, a handful of people will staunchly defend The Hobbit as the more enjoyable for what it is, despite The Lord of the Rings being clearly the epic. In Suicoden 1, there were murmurs of things going on outside of the border. This has a whole world. You're hearing about different countries like Harmonia and areas like the Grasslands. It's as though after Murayama-san put the pen down on the first script, he decided to create the world around it. It opened up potential for more sequels, and that's exactly what happened with all the Suicoden games taking place in different regions of this world. And playing Suicoden 2 made me way more excited to jump into the other games in the series, just with these little teasers. I've never played Suicoden 3, and I want to jump into it as soon as humanly possible. That's not going to happen though. I need a few shorter games first. I've never been so utterly disappointed in a game before until I played Suicoden 4 back in the day. And yet, and yet, I want to play it because I want to know more about this world. I want to pay more attention to the lore, the timeline, what happened to certain characters. But when I was younger, I didn't really pay too much attention to that. I didn't even know Suicoden 4 took place before the events of even the first game. Well, now I'm older, and now I realize this huge world is full of stars of destiny. I want to go and play them. Suicoden 2 opened up the Suicoden world. And most of that is just from periphery text or flavor text. But how about the actual plot? The impact straight from the off is tremendous. 
and it's the one thing that's always stuck with me no matter how much the memories faded over time. Starting off as a young soldier in a youth brigade and then being used as a sacrifice in a false flag operation, that's pretty deep. And in my personal youth, I thought that was just so unbelievable. There's no way that could ever be real. And then I grew up and found out how awful human beings are. Sacrificing kids for your own personal gain, it paints the devil immediately. There are no blurred lines here. No, there's no Robin Thicke in this game. You've got the bad guy from the off. Or have you? I love the switch halfway through the game. You have the absolute devil incarnate in Luca Blight, one of the most terrifying adversaries in RPGs. Not only is he completely off his rocker, a bloodthirsty lunatic, but he is packing some Darth Vader levels of power. He comes across like an absolute beast. Usually princes in games come across as rather meekly beings, but you feel this guy could rip your head off. He's comically evil, but somehow they stop it coming across as a joke. That moment Luca makes the woman crawl on the floor and act like a pig before slaughtering her. Man, that's like some serious war crime shit going on. I'm not sure any other JRPGs were doing this sort of stuff at that time. Can you think of any? You hate this guy and you're terrified of him at the same time. He's more scary than Sephiroth. It doesn't matter how strong you become throughout the story, you will always be dreading coming head to head with him. And truly, perhaps the best thing, the number one thing Sui Koden did so epically was taking him out halfway through the game. And it would make any climactic ending proud. Seriously, the game could have ended there. Luke is dead, Joe is the king, let's shake hands and make peace. I think most people would have enjoyed that. Yeah, it might have come out of nowhere at that particular time, but you know, they could have changed the build up. Having three parties take him on, making him fall back, retreat, only to be ambushed time and again. He goes down like an absolute champ. Even with a volley of arrows, he's a truly wounded tiger not giving up. He might as well be a T-Rex after taking hit after hit, being worn down until his last breath. He is an absolute prick, but man, you've got to respect the endurance. The genius moment of having him open the box of fireflies is just poetically beautiful and shocking at the same time. The volley of arrows striking him, it's unforgettable. It goes down as one of the greatest moments in JRPG history. It's incredibly shocking when you realize he's actually dead. Because you know there's still a ton of the game to go unless you somehow missed 50% of the Stars of Destiny. You know, there's no way the game is going to end now. And I tell you what, with how devilish he is, part of your brain is thinking he's going to come back at the end, right? He's going to be like a zombie, maybe something to do with Necklord. But no, he is well and truly an ex-king. Damn, the evilest man in gaming gone. It's worth noting, despite the incredible war going on, and it's supposedly good versus evil, there are very few bad people in this game. Even amongst your enemies, very few are the kind you wouldn't be happy to have a beer with in a bar. Like thinking off the top of my head, who are the absolute pricks? The ones you wouldn't piss on if they were on fire. Well, Luca, obviously. Gerudo, the leader of the knights, he's a knob. Necklord, well, he didn't really have much part to play in the war story. And maybe Raud, I wouldn't say he's particularly evil. He's not a nice chap, but we've all worked with people similar to him. And is that it? Like, who else is actually a bad person? Luca's generals aren't. Joey is doing it to bring peace. Gulgan and Seed want Joey to succeed so they can stop Luca from destroying the world. Same with Leon, he, he's a hard dude to suss. He's determined to win, but also determined to end the war as soon as possible with as few casualties as possible. I don't think he's a bad person per se, perhaps mentally ill. He thinks soldiers and people are pawns of fate to be used, but used for a good end result. I probably wouldn't have a beer with that dude though. Kiba and Klaus switched sides as soon as Luca became king. There are so few bad people who you fight, I wonder if that's just some kind of commentary on the silliness of war. Like, what is the point? I'm pretty sure we could all sit in a pub and have a beer together. I'd even buy the round. Let's get drunk and start singing Backstreet Boys songs. That can bring any kingdoms together. Well, that's the bad people out of the way, but how about one of the most complex characters in gaming? Joey Atreides. Again, this is another twist in the tale. Joey is almost like the real hero of the game. At least I think of him in that regard. 
As Ryo is a mute, he's the one carrying the narrative right up until you split. He's likeable, strong-willed. He's the protagonist every JRPG dreams of, and you are stuck with a lump of wood. So when he does turn, you feel genuinely betrayed. This is like if in Suikoden 1, Gremio went and murdered Odessa, then somehow became the Emperor's right-hand general, and then became the Emperor himself. That's how almost unbelievable it is. And yet, it won't make sense initially. I think the game holds its cards too close to its chest sometimes. Just little nuggets of something to give reason to make him seem less cold, like he's just woke up from a coma and got a new personality. It would have been nice to see old Joey's personality in the mix there too. Becoming the king himself seems ludicrous when you talk about it out of context, but it's well executed over the course of the plot. Small build-ups of scenes of him rising to the occasion, earning Luca's trust, poisoning the king, becoming Luca's brother-in-law, and then finally taking the crown himself just because he wanted to end the war. And if he didn't, then this war may not have ended. If Luca did not die because of Joey, maybe Ryo could not have succeeded at all. Maybe Luca would have won. Surely that is the most heroic moment. And his reasoning for continuing to fight even after Luca is dead is fairly solid, even if it resulted in the deaths of thousands by keeping it going. A peace treaty could have happened, but would it have lasted? Joey just wanted to make sure no one could stir anything anymore, ruling the kingdom with the secure, probably fair system. He just wanted no enemies left, so finally there could be true peace. Not peace agreements or pacts that could easily turn into feuds or bitterness and then inevitable clashes. It's a fair point, just get it over with. Get potential future wars gone forever. And that makes you think, why didn't Ryo surrender? Why did he fight on? With a new king, one who probably wouldn't burn villages to the ground and make ladies go oink oink before lopping their heads clean off, perhaps it may have been worth surrendering. Maybe this is going in too deep, but you know, when your video is a couple of hours long already, what's the harm in speculating for the sake of it? Well, okay, perhaps the answer is easier than I'd like it to be. Yeah, I'd written a whole word salad of speculation, but I think it's pretty clear. Why didn't they surrender? Because it's their damn country. Get out, leave us alone. It's like if George Clooney suddenly became the president of Russia, I'm not sure Ukrainians would go, eh, yeah, you know what, maybe. Even if Rio gave up and went back to Highland, the people of the city-state wouldn't give up fighting no matter what. Joey may seem cold once he's become king, but still, deep down, he's the same person he always was. At the top of his castle, the Highland army's numbers up. You think it would be an epic showdown to the death, but no, Joey has his priorities. His wife and Pilika, who's basically his adoptive daughter right now. Is it cowardly? No, I don't think so. I'd do the exact same thing. Well, I probably wouldn't have connived my way to be the king in the first place. I'd have been rumbled straight away. Obviously, depending on what ending you get, either you don't see Joey again, you kill him, or you redeem him. I do wish these options were more obvious because it's so incredibly easy to get the standard ending. I'm personally a guy that's all about not hand-holding. These past like five, six years or so, I'm just utterly sick of constant tips, puzzle solutions without giving you time to think, map icons, next quest locations, like come on, let people use their brains, do it for themselves. You know, accessibility in gaming is fine. Perhaps that's why gaming is more popular than ever. Anyone can play games and is instantly gratified. Making gamers stuck or lost is seen as a failure on the publisher's side and game development. Personally, not allowing people to use their brains is a failure for me. But hey, my point is, I like to figure out stuff for myself. But even me, the boorish gatekeeper that I am with games being too handholdy, I kind of wish there was more guidance to get the best ending. Why? Because the best ending is perfect, and the others are just not satisfactory. And I wish everyone could get it the first time of trying. I can only imagine how unsatisfactory the ending would be if you got, like, probably the most common one. Obviously, the greatest hurdle is getting the 108 stars in time, which I'll get to in a second. That's not the issue. The issue is that after all the effort and hard work, it's still massively easy to piss on your own shoes. Firstly, knowing to find Joey right at the end. I don't remember seeing anyone even hinting at that. Sure, the game tells you to meet up there 30 hours ago, but who remembers that? And yes, if you do get the second best ending when the credits roll, 
it does show Joey waiting for you at the cliffside. But come on, you've just seen the end credits. That's got to be a massive downer to tell you, hey, look, you're ballsed up. It's like you're so pleased that you finished your homework, but then your teacher tells you to do it again. And then the idea to only use defense, don't attack once, that's obscure. Did anyone tell me that? I don't remember. The true ending should be given as long as you get 108 stars, in my opinion. There are too many variables afterwards that I feel sorry for anyone who went to all that effort and buggered it up. Like, uh, I did myself. It didn't cost me a whole lot of time, but uh, enough to annoy me slightly. Because while there are a few variables you need to ensure a full, satisfying ending, there are none as ridiculous as saving Nanami. I originally did not save her, and I was massively confused as to why. Resting the best ending on a millisecond quick time event is such a dick move. I swear, the first time I pressed it fast, but it wasn't fast enough, apparently. And for those who enjoy the story, enjoy reading the dialogue properly, ain't none of you mashing that button. There's no way to see this coming. You will be screwed because if you don't do it fast enough, you don't jump forward, which is apparently all you need to do to save her life. But it is so subtle, you probably don't even notice it. And come on, everyone loves Nanami. She deserves to be saved more easily. Again, it should have been binary. You get 108 stars, she's saved. You get less, she's dead. That would have sufficed. And the end duel, perhaps, yeah, that not attacking thing is quite poignant and quite meaningful, but maybe the game could have just blanked out the attack button so you could only defend anyway. That would have been enough of a message to the player, right? <sighs> and Nanami, she is definitely worth saving because she is the one character who's pretty much with you the entire game. I can imagine some finding her mildly annoying with a slight tsundere personality, but she's a cheerleader, she's positive, She's also the comic foil, the butt of many jokes. She carries a lot of the much needed humor in this game. She's your big sister, she's badass. Perhaps not as a fighter in your team, and I'm sure many of you would wish that you could have her out of the battling party more just to give you more freedom, but she's a pillar of this game. She's the connection between the old friendship with Joey. She's family, and when she takes an arrow, god damn it, that is powerful. It's incredibly emotional and even has Ryo feeling lost. The total shock of it, it's powerful. As I said though, if you come off the back of Suicoden 1, it's sad and emotional, but you still have that hope that having collected all 108 stars, she'll be resurrected. Although I do applaud the slight twist of her not actually dying, but pretending to be dead in order to distance herself from Ryo. Tired of war, tired of having to see Joey and Ryo go head to head, she's had enough and she can't be a liability to Ryo anymore. And boy has she hinted that the entire game. Constantly asking when the war will stop. If Ryo and her can just run away from the fight, go to a faraway country. Admittedly, it is tempting to do that. Who would want to be part of the war? And actually, as you may have guessed, Suikoden 2 has a lot of variables. And in fact, you can apparently end the game early if you want to by agreeing to give up. When you're in Tinto, you have to agree to it many, many times to make sure you don't bugger it up by selecting the dick answer for a laugh, but it is, it is possible to end Suicoden 2 early. It seems like a choice no one would really make because no one would take it seriously, but it can happen. And even if you only go ahead with a plan to run away for a short while before taking the route back into the game, it can affect the plot. Ridley is a constant character in the game, but you can actually let him die if you choose to run away during Necklord's segment. He dies while looking for you. It doesn't affect the 108 stars because he actually gets replaced by his son, who the internet tells me is called Boris, but I've never seen him in the game because I've never done that before. Yeah, there's a whole new character I think most people will never see. And Suicoden 2 is great for that. The 108 stars are not set in stone. Some characters will be different star signs depending on who you recruit. There's actually 115 stars in total, plus a handful of characters who can join you but aren't even considered a star. Anyways, that's a bit of a tangent, I'll come to this very soon. But first, there is one character who I have not talked about, perhaps the most important of them all. Muku Muku. Okay, not really. Ryo, Suikoden 2's silent-ish hero. 
yeah, he's not so easy to talk about, like as a character who doesn't really have much personality, the personality is you, to a degree, and by that, are you either an inspiring, heroic bastion of the people, or are you a bit of a dick? One of the things I appreciate from Suicoden 2 is that although Ryo doesn't speak on his own free will, you will have so many dialogue choices to make. It kind of feels like he's not silent, just a bit shy. You are always choosing what you want to say, and it's great aside from it's almost always binary. Either you say the good thing, or you're an absolute dick. Probably in a jokey kind of way, but there's not much room to wiggle. I can't imagine anyone constantly choosing the knobhead dialogue choice, as it's almost painful to see them pop up all the time. At least it's funny just seeing them as an option. So yeah, Ryo doesn't have too much personality in his own, which uh, is a shame. I prefer RPGs to have a protagonist who have their own personality, even if they're a little bit dickish, like Cloud from FF7. Games like Skies of Arcadia, where Vice is just an alright top dude, that's even more preferable than someone whose only personality is from the choices you make. And I guess that's what RPGs were originally built on, you know, a role-playing game. It's supposed to be you in this kind of world thing. But as someone who scores a boring plus slash vacant charisma plus plus on the personality scale, that's not great. I'm not egotistical enough to want to play as myself. I want to be someone I'm not. They are way more interesting. But there are some good moments with Ryo. The fact that his childhood plays an important role. The flashbacks to childhood are great for showing you what kind of life he led up to this point. And of course, he has a lot more visual personality with his body language and reactions. When Nanami cops it, for example, he's far more animated than Tia was in Suicoden 1, so it's a definite step up. Plus, I heard in Suicoden 3, they decided to ditch the silent protagonist, so I'm looking forward to that. Overall, I think for a silent protagonist, they probably made the best of it. As far as games with silent protagonists go, I can't think of any other that handled it as well as Suicoden 2. Can you think of any? Let me know in the comments if you can tell me a game where the silent protagonist was done really, really well. Also, as a side tangent, I must have written the word silent so many times during my Silent Hill script that now when I'm writing it, I automatically capitalize the S. Muscle memory. So, I think that's most of the main characters out of the way. Because of the ensemble cast, the vast amount of characters, there's not too many who are fleshed out to the point of being able to analyze them, but uh, I do have to comment on Shu, the strategist who, look, with the greatest of respect for him, he's never going to live up to Matthew. In fact, he's pretty much Matthew Light. You could swap their portraits and most people would be none the wiser, which makes him less interesting since Matthew already had a badass ending that could never be topped. I do applaud that they did the bait and switch where you roll your eyes and think she was even going to copy Matthew's death, but no, he's saved by Victor. That was a nice surprise. One of the best things about Suicoden 2 are the returning characters. I think they got the balance perfect. There's plenty of old faces to make you feel safe, make you feel at home in this world, connecting the two games together without relying on them too much. Kind of like how Pokemon games, they still have the old Pokemon mixed in with the new generation. Victor and Flick are perfect for this. While I do think their role in the overall plot is minor, I mean, they're just badass generals at this point, with them in your army, you feel good. They've been through this shit before, and they came out on top. And with their experience in your ranks, nothing feels impossible. It's always a delight seeing some familiar faces, whether it be Jean, the big booby goddess, Fudge and Humphrey, even seeing the hapless Hicks and Tengar, who become full-on comic relief in this game. These guys don't add a whole lot to the overall plot, it's just nice to be among old friends. I will say that some of the new characters in Suicoden 2 don't leave their mark as much. Perhaps it's my nostalgia getting in the way of that a little bit, but I think most of them are too optional, if that's even a thing. While the plot is great, only a few of the same faces will be popping up in the meeting rooms. Shu, Apple, Ridley, Teresa, Klaus and his dad. Yeah, Flick and Victor are there, but their job is just to do the dirty work. And very few people force their way into your party to make them memorable. Like just off the top of my head, aside from the ones I just mentioned, which new characters do I remember the most? Well, there's Freed because he's forced into your party twice. Then there's the Necklord tangent, Khan and Sierra. Miklatov has an interesting enough character. And Chaco is a pretty cool kid. Chaco is one of the unsung stars of the game and does a lot towards winning the war. Not bad for a character you're initially designed to dislike. Out of the 123 total characters, that's not much. 
which I'm not saying that's a negative, by the way, it's just an observation. Because it does have its positives, it means it's a lot more focused, the plot is not diluted, you won't be getting lost on different characters, and you can become more familiar with the main core of the cast. They don't come in for 5 minutes and then bugger off. It has a core cast which is needed in such a long game. 85 of the characters in this game are optional, and yes, I counted them even the ones that don't count as Stars of Destiny. That's a huge amount. Suicoden 1 has 63 optional ones. Again, I want to stress this is not a complaint, it just highlights the different approach to storytelling. As I've not played Suicoden 3, and my memories of 4 and 5 are vague at best, then perhaps a lot of these Suicoden 2 characters are expanded upon in later games, you know, to make them more memorable. I know a lot of them, specifically Suikoden 2 characters, appear in Genso Suiko Gaiden 1 and 2, visual novels, where the first one takes place within the story of Suikoden 2 from a different perspective, and gives characters who, shall we say, lack much in the way of exposure in the main game, got some time to shine, like Kinnison, Templeton, Wakaba, and even Connell, who I'm pretty sure doesn't even move in Suikoden 2, even he's given something to do. So there's that, and I love the idea of that. I can't wait to get stuck into the Suiko Gaiden volumes, and they're going to be the Patreon bonus video when I do Suicoden 3, because those do have a connection to that game as well. But please, let's throw the tangents out of the window, because it's time to talk about Suicoden's finest gimmicks, the two things that have always made them stand out from the crowd. Recruitment and base building. Two things that are intricately linked to one another. Many RPGs have recruitment, I mean just look at Pokemon, that's technically character recruitment, but there's something about Suicoden that gets it so perfectly and none better than Suicoden 2. Over the course of 30 hours, you'll be challenged to find and recruit all 108 stars of destiny. As I said, there are more than that, but you can only have 108 as the maximum. And let me tell you, if you thought Suicoden 1 recruitment was an absolute breeze, uh, the, the Suicoden 2 is like the dark souls of character recruitment. While the original game has its tense moments recruiting, like the pawn duel, making sure you've recruited characters in a very short window of opportunity before the end, and just weirdly out of the way ones like Pez Merge and Crowley, Suicoden 2 takes the biscuit. From a casual perspective, this is the kind of game strategy guys were made for. Unless you play with a guide, it is highly, highly unlikely you will recruit every single character for the first time of trying. It's not impossible, it's just unlikely. I both love it and hate it for that, mostly love. I guess the game has its own internal guide. There's a brilliant recruitable character here called Richmond. He's a hard-boiled private detective, and not sure how he fits into this medieval fantasy universe, but uh, he's cool and he has one of the best abilities in the game. If you pay him money, he will give you hints about recruiting all of the characters ones you've already come across, and ones you can meet but have not done so yet. He'll give you all the advice you need to point you in the right direction. It's a nice compromise to buying a $10 strategy guide, I'll give it that. This is just full of the weirdest stuff, some of them with full-blown side quests, others with ridiculous requirements like Stallion. He's called Stallion because he's got a huge penis. Not really, he's just really fast. He was in Suicoden 1, you remember, right? He... He does jack shit in this game, but if you want to recruit him, you need to beat him in a race. And how do you beat him in a race? You need to run away from 50 enemies. You're practicing running away? You learn? Uh, Olin is a badass lady, an early favorite of mine, but damn to get her, you need to walk into a certain town with only female party members outside of Rio, of course at which point you get harassed by the town deviants. Even Ryo gets taken, but before Ryo can get bummed, Olan rescues you. Without Richmond's advice here, I doubt anyone, anyone would think of doing this. Maybe some NPCs give small hints, but nothing I saw that spelled it out. Muku Muku, the super squirrel, and his other squirrel squad members, Muku Muku is just bizarre. I don't care about the others since they're not part of the Stars of Destiny, just bonus characters, but Muku Muku is apparently destined to help bring peace to the country. He's one of the earliest recruitable characters. If you talk to a random tree outside of your home three times, he will join you. Of course, I didn't record that. I'm not mental or psychic enough to start talking to trees in Suicoden 2. I mean, I do that enough in real life because they're the only things that listen to me. But that's thankfully not the only way to recruit him because it gets even more mental. 
because if you want to recruit him later, you have to walk in a specific area on the world map with one empty space in your party. And then he may or may not magically appear in your party, because why not? Dude, Jude, this guy who does almost nothing aside from making sculptures in your castle, if you want him, you need to give him some clay. Where is this clay? This random NPC hiding in a random town in a slightly obscure area with zero indication. Bloody hell, Richmond! Come on, Richmond, help me! Yeah, there's no way to know this without Richmond helping you. Richmond is the real hero of Suicoden 2. I do wonder how many actually realize his ability because in your castle, he's in an, like an off to the side kind of place in the barracks, which many people may have missed. And you know, there's so many people to talk to, maybe you didn't try. I bet a lot of people miss this guy's superpower. And he's the one who can add so much more information to these characters because even after recruiting them, you can pay him money to spy on everyone up to three times, giving little tidbits of information for each of them. Some very revealing about their true personalities or their feelings or their backstory. Some are humorous, like how he complains he's following a unicorn around and that he's impressed that he has a focus on the ladies. That horse is a literal stud. I also want to give a shout out to my good friend Gordon, who was the mightiest pain in the arse to recruit out of all of them. It could and should have been fairly easy if I was prepared in advance, because one of the mechanics in Suicoden 2 is the trading shops. You buy items in one town, go to another one, and hopefully try to sell them for a profit. Each town has their own quirks that change over the course of the game. If you want Gordon, he says you need to have at least 50,000 profits using this system. For someone who completely ignored it up till finding him, it was a bit of a nightmare earning all that money. It took at least one hour and a half just to recruit Gordon, and it's made all the more painful that he resides in Gregminster, the one place on the planet you can't teleport to for some reason, and it's a long ass trek there. Through forests and mountains and more forests and ample amounts of random encounters, genuine pain in the ass. And the worst thing is, after you've recruited him, you don't even need him anymore. By this point, you already have enough cash for what you want and late game encounters will max out your money in just a couple of battles. Gregminster is awesome though. It's a genuine oh my god moment in this game. Am I really going back to Gregminster? It's almost Pokemon Gold and Silver levels of recall. Sure, it's only one town and you're not free to do a whole lot, but seeing loads of characters again, it almost brings a tear to your eye. Speaking of tear, he is not considered a star of destiny, but he's one of the most badass characters in this game to use. And if you want to use him, well, you got to trek all the way here every single time. I wanted him for Necklord because I thought, you know, that'd be kind of poetic. But because the party gets disbanded just before fighting Necklord, you don't really have a chance. Or at least I couldn't be asked to go all the way back to Greg Mystic to get him. I had to take him with me for the final encounter though. A great moment. It's one of the best ideas Suicoden 2 had. Not just here though. See many characters once again like Cleo, Pan, even Sarah. It's great. You somehow miss something without their portraits, but I get it. I guess they didn't want to confuse the player into thinking that they might be recruitable. It's nice seeing them nonetheless. Even chatting to random NPCs, you get a feeling for what's going on in Tauren these days. It's reminiscence at its finest and it gives you a lot of closure to the first game. The castle for the Smeg army kind of took me by surprise somewhat because I was not expecting to just take over an abandoned town, especially one where the villagers were transformed into zombies. I was only expecting to go and expel Necklord and that's it. It's initially deceptive in its grandeur. It doesn't seem particularly impressive as you're sprinting towards the Batman. It's a bit mazy and directionless. Nothing really indicates that this is going to be your base of operations. And even the cutscene in the game is hardly enthused about the matter. They're like, yeah, well, this is, this is our castle now. There's no celebration or pageantry. It's kind of underwhelming. But aside from that, this place is so, so awesome. I mean, I quite like the rigid verticality of Suicoden 1, but damn, this is the place that keeps on giving. Just when you think you've finished exploring, no. You'll find a new room or a new corridor you didn't think existed before. Where did this dojo come from? Was it always there? I don't know. And the way it expands alongside your recruits, it's glorious to see it develop. From a dilapidated ruin to a bustling, well-constructed fortress. 
You're always interested in seeing what new things pop up with each recruit, like a farm, or a fishing place, or a telescope, the restaurant, the baths, the shops, how busy Leona's bar is. You want to walk around and just talk to everyone to know their thoughts. It's so lively. You'll find people in different places over time, and it's not only your recruits, but soldiers, and kids, maids, builders. This is a fully living place. More than 108 people live here. There is a community. It's not just a place to get the latest story plot points. It feels like your home. There is only one issue I have with the castle in Suicoden 2, and that's the final castle level. Between 1 and 3, there is a clear defining development and growth. The final tier, which should be the most epic, right? Well, it's not actually much of an upgrade. As far as I can tell, your bedroom gets bigger. And that's it. Where's the helicopter pad? That's the ultimate sign of being a Bobby Big Bollocks. As I said, this place is full to the brim with stuff. Almost everything you could ever need, including plenty of minigames and subquests that aren't even really talked about or even tracked, they're sort of there for you to discover, like the farm. You can get seeds for your farmer dude, and you can also find farm animals just randomly in towns and take them back to Yuzu, who looks after them. Why? Why not? Why not pick up a little baby chicken take it back home? Wanna buy a cow for three grand? Shut up! Of course I do! What I gather from this is that this affects the amount of ingredients available for the cook-off minigame, which is a treat in itself, and even its own damn game pretty much. There's quite a lot going on. There are like 40 recipes to pick up and use in the cook-offs, which is both humorous and a fun challenge. With your recipes, you have to choose an appetizer, main course, and dessert, and the judges are randomly chosen recruits who all have different tastes. Despite you being their god-chosen leader, they're not entirely biased towards giving you more points. They can vote in favor of the rival chef. And you don't even get the pleasure of lopping their heads off if they do. Damn. Yeah, there are a dozen challenges, and there's even a plotline to follow involving your head chef. Even Antonio from the first game makes an appearance here. I love the fact one of your challenges is called You Come, as though they know. You don't really get much out of this going all the way to the end, but it's definitely one of the more fun distractions out there. And I love the animation work and the writing put into it. Way too much thought went into this. With some liking more spicy foods, some liking fish, some liking western style, Chinese style. I mean, that breaks the fourth wall somewhat. Does China and Japan exist in this world? Does that mean communism can exist in Suikoden? You got like Richmond gathering all these secret pieces of information on your team members at Ryo's request. Is Ryo Stalin? And you're being invaded by Highland. Are they the Germans? Is Joey Hitler? Did Stalin and Hitler ride off in the sunset together? It's just a thought. Back to cooking. Yes, of the numerous minigames in here, like fishing or whack-a-mole, this is the one that offers something truly memorable. Not that the others aren't welcome. Fishing's great, I just wish there were more fish. I'd have spent a lot more time doing it. Whack-a-mole, to be honest, I couldn't get the controls. And apparently there is a rope climbing minigame, but hell if I ever saw it. I tell you, this game is full of things most people won't see on the first time playing. Even like 20 years after the game came out, People still can't decide how to 100% definitely make sure to keep Nanami alive. There are so many variables and secrets and stuff. There's even another Nanami one, because like at the beginning of the game, when you're escaping execution and stuff, you're told you should go grab Nanami before legging it out of town. Well, apparently, apparently, you can just ignore her and she doesn't join you until later in the game, when you're denied access to Muse after the mercenary fortress is destroyed. Now, I haven't scientifically counted it, but that feels like hours. There's a whole side quest for Clive, who, by the way, is one of the crews that's very easy to miss. Yeah, if you happen to not bump into him in a very short window at Muse, well, sorry, buddy, he's gone. And that happens in like an out of the way place where less adventurous people would, they, they would never go. Anyways, Clive has an entire plotline that I'm pretty sure zero people knew about unless they bought the official guide. The gist of it is, you need to get to various plot locations in a short space of time. For example, before 11 hours have passed, you need to be in Lake West. And not past 15 hours before liberating Rock Axe. 
and pretty much get to the end of the game within 20 hours. And Clive must be in your party for all of those. And if they are, some great little scenes will happen. Imagine a JRPG having a speedrun challenge and this is it. Of course, I've never done this and never will. But you know, a quick goosey on YouTube wouldn't go amiss because it is a bit of a challenge. I finished the game in 32 hours or so and I can't imagine taking 12 hours off of that. That doesn't seem fun to me. But it is a challenge and the game has a few nice side quests as well. Way more signposted than Clive's ones that I actually accomplished like Hicks and Tengar, the comedy duo from the first game. I have to be honest, I'm a bit biased against these two since Tengar is just bossy, life controlling, reminds me of a very miserable relationship I had once and Hicks, well Hicks is just the wet towel of a human being. But I have to say as mildly boring and inconvenient this quest was, it was really funny and made me warm up to both of them. It's almost a parody of RPG fetch quests because Tengar wants Hicks to actually grow some bollocks or at least hairs on the ones he has. Tengar pretends to be sick and forces the Cobalt Chief to lie about a cure to go to three arbitrary places to pick up three arbitrary items. You know this, everyone knows this, except Hicks. And it's funny. I especially love that the Chief had to make the Cobalt run on ahead to make sure the item needed was there in the first place that they said it would be. Yeah, I hated Hicks because in Suicoden 1, you have to use him on the front line against Necklord, the most difficult, or at least second most difficult boss in the game. And he's as useful as spring air freshener in the dysentery ward. But I like him a lot more now. Another one is the Foot and Humphrey side quest, which I'm disappointed. Uh, mostly I didn't record because of an error with my software. But the gist of it was that Furch, who is now traveling with Humphrey, both of whom are important players in the first game, they are now looking for a new dragon for Furch. And you climb up a nearby mountain and find a dragon egg and it's adorable. This side quest and these two recruits are also easy to miss because you only really get one shot at it between two very close story plot points. Don't miss them, it's an easy mistake to make. I guess I haven't really covered the thing that you'll be doing most in this game, and that is fighting. While there's a lot of story to enjoy, there's double the amount of fights. This is a game with a fairly high encounter rate, so hopefully the fighting should be enjoyable, right? Well, yeah, it's hard for me to get massively excited about it because it's almost exactly the same as the original game. You still have a six party team with two rows of three. Each fighter is adept at different distances. You can do a few unite attacks, which is when certain characters share some kind of bond. Maybe I was just unlucky with my party selections, but I had so few unite options in this game, it's almost as though they didn't exist, at least for me. Maybe if I picked different characters next time around. It's almost exactly the same as the original game, but there is one major difference, and that is the magic, because the magic is much, much better this time around. Yes, the magic is very powerful in Suicoden 1 if you give it the time of day, but by the time you get to anywhere it's useful in the game, you've probably already got it existing. But Suicoden 2 opens it wide with characters being able to equip three runes. Not everyone, some can only have one, two, some three. But now having so many options for customization, I found myself being a magic spammer. At the final battle, I had two fully equipped magic users to just decimate waves of enemies because so overpowered here. Yeah, on the two big boss fights of Luca Blight and the final boss, magic is cleverly nullified to make it a bit more fair. But my boy Luke, I hated him in Suicoden 1, now I love him. What an absolute chad. He is a beast throughout this game, nonchalantly raining death upon the hordes. And yeah, I know what's coming in Suicoden 3. It still kind of pains me there's no magic recovery items. That's the main reason I never used it in Suicoden 1. But here, I let it go because of just how powerful it is. Would it be so rude as to ask for some, just some, even if they're rare, just so I can save them for a rainy day? You know, if you get to a boss fight, but you used up all the magic along the way in the dungeon, and you've got a tool of a wizard just standing there not being able to do much, and you know, vice versa. If you want to save his usage until the boss, leading up, you're carrying a party member who's not going to be doing much aside from an emergency. You might as well have five characters in the dungeon. Four if you decide to take two mages. I guess with the battle system, they didn't really need to change too much. Why mess with almost perfection? Despite having six characters and potentially six enemies, it's still snappy and quick. 
The auto battle is fine for a lot of normal enemies, and even manually spamming your attacks is quick. Everything responds quickly. There was no need to change anything from the first game, just for the sake of it. One change is that some allies are so big they take up two slots. The Unicorn and the Griffin take up two places, so theoretically, if you want those two in your party, you'll only have four fighters. I used the Unicorn just a little bit to see how I felt, and yeah, he is super strong, but I'm not sure like he was worth missing an extra fighter. The Sui Coden 2, not a particularly tough game. Perhaps it's because I was repping Luke for the most part. Perhaps it's because I'm somewhat in the Sui Coden zone still, but very rarely did I feel under the cosh. I only failed a couple of times. The first time you confront Necklord and being hit by that big hairy monster, and then Luca Blight, which I put mostly down to me thinking it was a fight I was supposed to lose. <clears throat> kind of. Sure, the second time was an insanely tight fight, and of course the final boss was quite tense, but in a whole game, that's not a lot of battles that I thought I was going to lose or I did lose. Yeah, it's not a difficult RPG. Not that I'm saying it's a rollover either, it's just a nicely balanced game. As long as you've got your armor up to snuff, you've got your weapons sharpened enough, which uh, admittedly is a bit of a pain in the arse this time around, and you've got your rune equipped to as many people as possible, you can give the game a good go without trying too hard. I think this partly comes to the fact that Ryo is going to be one of your main healers. It's slightly less badass to have your main character not have devastating magic as his true rune, but the plus side of that is that you always have a healer on standby, with plenty of magic to spare and super strong at that. He's not exactly a tank, but he won't be wiped out easily. You've always got him to rely on to keep your party in tip-top shape, and you don't have to waste a party slot on a dedicated healer, nor waste a turn on using medicine, which uh, definitely took a backseat in this game despite having way more options in that department. There are so many types of healing items, yet I barely used any of them. And for the record, at no point did I grind in this game. Not once. I was just going about doing my thing, fighting most of the enemies I came across, and even occasionally running away from battles. Yeah, like uh, when I ever wanted to go to Gregminster, when I couldn't be asked. Is grinding an RPG a myth? Because I've played for this channel Suicoden 1, Suicoden 2, and Skies of Arcadia, and not once, not once did I have to grind in either of them. And that's not like a subtle boast about how I'm a tactical genius. No, I'm a moron. Where's the grinding people talk about? One of the big complaints about the original game is the utterly daft inventory system. Yeah, it was bizarre and restrictive, but having played it so much, I became nullified to its weirdness. It didn't bother me anymore. Sweet Coden 2 is a step up, but it still has some small issues. This time around, you have a joint inventory alongside characters' personal inventories, which thankfully only consists of equipment and then three slots for either accessories or healing items. Yet you must equip the healing items before you go into battle, otherwise you have to waste a turn grabbing them out of the main inventory. I just didn't like the fact that certain items take up space in the main inventory since, once again, you are clamoring, begging just for a bigger bag. It's all about the bonus or extra items, things like old books, window sets, sound crystals, animals for your farm. You're not going to sell them, can't they just be thrown into the key items section? And trading. Look, I don't mind trading items taking up slots, but did they need to take up individual slots? Like, you want to buy some sugar for, say, like a 120 potch. Nobody would buy just one, because what's the point in getting 40 potch profit? You need to buy in bulk. So, you buy 20 of them. Well, yeah, but 20 sugar is 20 slots in your inventory. That's one extra notch in the annoyingness of the trading quest for Gordon. So, yeah, it's better, but not perfect. We'll have to see how they handle it in Sui Coden 3. In terms of the presentation... Well, perhaps back in the day, it wasn't particularly impressive, but as we've gotten used to the pixel sprites being considered art, we can look at them from a more appreciative perspective. Sui Coden 2 is just utterly gorgeous in every single way. The character sprites and their designs, there's just so many small attentions to detail. So many one-off animations that probably took days to put together, added in just because they wanted to make the most impressive game that they could. In a world of 3D, they wanted to show what pixels could really pull off. This is one of Sui Coden 2's hidden achievements. I know I don't mean like PSN trophies, I mean like it's the unsung upgrade over the first game. And not one that you may even initially realize. This is a so much better looking game, with character reactions, 
unexpected moments, very subtle, but so much more dramatic and emotional than Suicoden 1, where the characters just basically just jump up as stiff as a board. This here happens too, mostly for comedic effect, but there's so much more than that. The backgrounds too are so much clearer, crisper, with an overwhelming amount of detail. Part of me thinks that the towns are pre-rendered, but no, it's pixel art, I think. Wonderful, wonderfully handcrafted. Things get less interesting in the dungeon areas, which is also a slight negative to the game, but there's some good stuff in here like the final dungeon and Matilda's Knight's Castle. The one thing that could be really improved on are the battle arenas, which are in 3D, and bring us back into the, oh yeah, this is the PS1 world. Mixing character sprites with 3D backgrounds always looked a little funky for the time, but it's quite an iconic look these days. The monster designs are also great, at least when they weren't reusing the same monsters from the first game. During the first handful of hours, you're going to be coming across almost the same monsters as Suicoden 1, which for the beginning of the game is very worrying, and you're going to be thinking, oh my god, is it going to be all like this? Well, at least there's going to be a big booby ant queen. Uh, sadly, I don't remember a big booby ant queen in Suicoden 2. And that's because they decided to transition away from the older enemies into new monsters unique to this game. I like to think that all the reused assets were because they just needed a little bit of time to make the unique stuff from scratch. You can almost see the cutter point where they actually caught up and started making new ones. You all know I'm a big fan of the big booby vampire lady. She's a top tier enemy in this game. I almost felt bad for taking her out. The music is a tough one because the first game was so unique for me. And this continues the trend. I don't know if I enjoy it more or less. It's difficult to say considering the first game is so completely ingrained in my head. What I will say is that this soundtrack does a really great uh, melancholic or reflective tracks. The slow sweet ones are definitely the best here. But there's a couple of standout rocking tracks, the most famous of which is the Necklord theme which goes hard as hell. Almost like a Euro dance mix, it's an insane track and one of the best that the series is known for. And by the way, if you want to purchase the CD, which are somehow still available, brand new, even in 2023, check the links in the description. There's like four hours worth of music here, so uh, yeah, they split it into two CDs. In conclusion, Suicoden 2 is a masterpiece, with caveats that I've mentioned in the translation and the war battles. It takes so many things from the first game and fully realizes them, expands them, and then offers a side dish of awesome extras, then drizzles it in tartar sauce. I weirdly love tartar sauce. I will dunk anything in that bad boy. The story is way more ambitious, it's complicated, and requires you to process the implications of what you're reading. It's daring, twisting, surprising, and an all round, it's you know one of the best stories in JRPGs. But it would be if the translator didn't go for a cigarette break in the middle. And yes, before any localizers in the industry comment, I know, I know, I am joking. That is on the publisher with unreasonable timescales. But seriously, just imagine what could have been if that good translator said no to that first cigarette. Just say no kids, you could ruin a masterpiece. It's a game utterly packed with an overly generous amount of content from mini games, secrets, details, variables, many of which the average Joe wouldn't even notice, but they put it in because they wanted to create something special above and beyond and my God, they did. After playing Suicoden 2 again, finally, and giving it the true time and thoughts it deserves, do I still prefer Suicoden 1? No, not quite. I mean, they both have their pros. I love how breezy the first game is. You could wake up at 6am, boot up the PlayStation and finish it before tea, and it would be a glorious experience for the unemployed. It's packed to the brim with everything you could want in a story in terms of shocking moments. 15 hours, it's great. Of course, it's a simple premise of let's defeat the Empire by conquering one area at a time. And that's where 2 comes in. It stretches everything out and it's way more in depth. It's more thoughtful and more tense. You can really get into it. You can sink your teeth into it. Suicoden 2 has everything and then some. But Suicoden 1 offers something easily digestible, which is perfectly acceptable as an option. Some people want that these days. At the time of release, Suicoden 2 was mostly met with mild acclaim. GameStop gave it a 7.6 for example. Nobody really went overboard, probably being less than enamored with its seemingly simple mechanics, only expanding on the original and not really offering anything new. 
This proves game critics have no idea what they're talking about and very rarely do they get anything spot on at the time of writing. Either a game is harshly treated or overly massively hyped because it's something new and shiny. I've been guilty of both when doing Switch Watch reviews, like just off the top of my head, I probably didn't give the original Atelier Riser the credit it deserves. It kind of felt more of the same, but after a year and the game had ruminated in me for longer, I actually felt I did it a bit of a disservice. That's just one random example and I could probably pick up many more if I thought about it. What I'm saying is, I don't think games show their true colours until a long while after release. A bit like Blade Runner, you know? Blade Runner is awesome, it just took a while for people to realise it. I believe Studio Coden 2 is the same. These days it's widely considered to be one of the greatest JRPGs ever made and it commands a ridiculous price if you want to buy an original copy on the PlayStation 1. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that this is probably one of the most emulated RPGs of all time. In fact of any genre, mainly down to its lack of availability. Out there, come on, admit it, who out there have emulated this game before? In fact, the whole series has been treated so poorly by Konami, why would you not want to make such in-demand titles available? And Sweet Code 2 was stuck on the PS1 until 2005, when it was ported to the PSP in a double pack. But only in Japan. Interestingly, they did tweak it somewhat. They actually made it widescreen, which uh, did bork a few aspects of the game, like apparently Luca's death scene is mildly anticlimactic since you can see the archers waiting to fire at him. There's no surprise. You could even walk diagonally in the game, but uh, the, the West never got this, which is soul destroying because I knew it was out in Japan and I was just begging, begging that one day it would come to the West, but it never did. There was a re-release on the PSN for the PlayStation 1 version, alongside most of the other Suikoden's, but only in certain regions. It's like they wanted people to forget about Suikoden. But Suikoden has never lost its fan base. I think most Suikoden fans have played all of the games in the series out of sheer love, and while they may enjoy some more than others, there's always been a real thirst for more, more, more. But as time went on, there's been less, less, less. And all it's taken is another developer trying to copy their formula. And when I say copy, what I mean is copy the homework you've already done. Because Murayama-san, after years of being in the wilderness, decided he needed a bit of cash and thought, you know what, let me make that Suicoden game again, but uh, you know, change the name, don't copy it too much. And it was a roaring Kickstarter success, and even I, handed over more money than is advisable, I still haven't told my wife. And I think Konami smelled something, it smelled like cash. And so finally, very soon, we are getting a remaster of both Suikoden 1 and 2 in a wonderful looking package with new backgrounds, new 3D battle arenas, new effects, and fingers crossed, fixing the goddamn translation. Now I'm not the kind of weirdo who demands an entire retranslation because it must be at all costs 100% in line with the Japanese text, even if it ends up being the worst story, but you know, just fix the errors. Make it seem like some of the lines were spoken by a human, not a confused chatbot. There's only one worry I have about this collection, and that is the widescreen. As I said, they implemented widescreen for the PSP release, and that was either a bit lazy or it just completely ruined the mood of certain scenes. I just hope they tweak that a little bit. You know, put some goddamn trees in the way so we don't see them coming. At the time of recording this, the release date for this package is unknown, but it's supposed to be early 2023, and I implore you, as long as the package isn't completely broken, uh, which I doubt, I implore you to pick it up. Support the series. Maybe you feel insulted that Konami only woke up after Yuden Chronicle, but come on, you need to tell Konami we want more Suikoden. Maybe you personally are only mildly interested in Suikoden, but there are so many people out there who would die happy if it was successful enough for Suikoden to make a proper comeback. Suikoden 6 would be insane, so if you're not going to do it for yourself, then do it for the greater good. I'll even pop down links below where you can purchase it if and when it is available. Check them, maybe they'll be there, I don't know. As stated before, Suikoden 2 was followed by Suikoden 3, this time on new hardware on the Sony PlayStation 2, and Suikoden couldn't remain mostly 2D sprites forever. It just about worked here due to how unappealing some 3D games were of the time, but the PS2 was next level stuff, 3D had to be done. 
as Suikoden 2 was a mild commercial success, at least over time, Moriyama-san was given more free reign, and almost four years after Suikoden 2 released, three came out in Japan. I have never played it. It never released in Europe because Konami couldn't be asked to translate it into multiple languages. But sometime in 2023, I will be taking a look at it for the first time. I mean, it's technically, technically the most critically acclaimed game in the series. And yet, I've seen a good few comments, like in my Suicoden 1 video, especially about how like terrible it is. So we'll have to see. Thank you. Thank you for watching this video. If you watched all the way through, God, you are a legend, almost as big as a legend as the Monkey Funky, and in honor of the Monkey Funky's return, I want you to leave me an monkey, a, a funky monkey, not just any monkey, it needs to be a funky monkey emoji in the comments. And mostly, I would like to thank my Patreons. Here you all are, somewhere, thank you. Thank you for believing in me, thank you for enjoying my content, and especially to my ultra super duper producers, our man in Japan, my man in Japan, they Rich Sitorius Sven Nowlets Wixit Thank you, thank you so much. That's really nice of you. And if you want to join them, then it is the best way to support this channel. I recently lowered the price of the Patreon if you want to head over there and get lots of good things, ad-free videos, early access to these big videos, and long exclusivity to bonus videos. Plus, if you're on the higher tiers, you can vote for stuff. This thumbnail was chosen by them. And they have already voted for the next game, Parasite Eve. And I have a secret little Discord where I post small updates. I even gave a nice hint about a project I'm working on in the background. It's going to take a long time though. Patreon.com slash a bit more Jordan. Here is a preview of Suicoden 2's bonus video, Card Stories. Did I make it in three hours? Must be close. Hello Patreons, this video is for you, if you watch it. Now Suikoden 2 has come and gone, but did you know that in Japan there was a complete reimagining of the game on the Game Boy Advance? And by complete, I mean it's a completely different game almost. Same story-ish, but they threw out the gameplay. Out went the JRPG and in came the card battler. Now, if you've even vaguely watched my stuff over on Switch Watch, you probably already know how I feel about games with cards in them, but I'll try and keep my bias in check for this one. This was probably an attempt by Konami to try and tap in to the trading card craze. Between Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Digimon, there was a lot of cash flying around, and this game actually had a proper physical card tie-in as well. You buy the game, you buy the cards, hopefully this time next year we're all billionaires. Although considering there was only this game, and it only released in Japan, I think it's fair to say it didn't do much at the box office for Konami. Which is a shame because I really like this game. Yeah, it still has the deck building anxiety filled trappings that I despise so much, but the moment to moment gameplay is really fun, if totally at the mercy of RNG, or at least it seems that way to myself. It released in Japan in 2001, three years after Suikoden 2's PlayStation release. It's mostly a retelling of Suikoden 2 with an editor going to absolute town on the story because while the premise is here, the steps taken within the story are completely different. This is a case of let's see how much we can dismember and still get away with it. For example, in this retelling, Ryo and Joey get the Rune of Beginnings right at the beginning of the game, while they're hiding from the ambush. And Joey, Joey doesn't even jump off the cliff with you. He stays back and instantly turns to Lucas' side. Jump, you coward! Yeah, character development wasn't on the editor's mind.